meeting of uh, the wetlands uh, summer uh, fall study committee. Um, <clears throat> I was kind of waiting for our legislative council person, Michael Brady, to get here. But um, uh, I'll call the meeting. I'll call the meeting to order and we'll um, introduce, introduce ourselves. And then I'm going to have Michael do a quick. We had a few questions from the previous meeting uh, of, from committee members. And I'm going to ask Michael to review uh, and those two questions. And then we'll get right on the schedule and stick with it. So, John, would you like to start and introduce yourself? Um, I'm John O'Brien. Uh, I represent Tundra <coughs> Royalty and I serve on the House of Agriculture. Uh, my name is Chris Bray. I serve in the Senate representing the Addison Senate. I'm Harvey Schmidt and I uh, serve on the House of Natural Resources Committee. <laughs> Amy Sheldon and I serve on the House Natural Resources Committee also. I'm Bobby Starr from Essex Orleans County, uh, chair of the Senate Ag Committee and also chair of this group. Uh, Representative Carolyn Partridge, I represent the Wyndham Three Districts and I chair the House Agriculture and Forestry Committee. Uh, Mark McDonald, I represent Orange County. Um, I serve on Natural Resources. Chris Pearson, Chittenden County Senate. Thank you, folks. Uh, Michael, um, would you like to review? We had a couple of questions from the members at the last meeting. Um, I think John asked a question. Well, it'd be nice to know what other states are doing. So you you asked for for two documents at the last meeting. One request came from Representative O'Brien is to, is to um, kind of elaborate, summarize on the key decision points that the committee needs to make. Remember, I went through the flow chart and said, here are some points or things that you need to deal with, and you wanted that in a more summarized form. I sent you each uh, a draft memo. Um, I have the final memo here, um, if every, anyone wants a copy. Um, 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 in addition, Representative Sheldon asked for uh, a comparison of um, exemptions, wetlands and permitting exemptions in other states. Uh, I also sent that to you, but it was formatted on this really crazy big paper. Um, I've been in IT hell this morning um, and not having been able to print this out. It is printing out in the copy room right now. Um, I looked at 13 different states. Uh, as I said in my email to you when I sent this, not every state has state wetlands law, um, so you're never gonna get a full 50 state comparison. Uh, in addition, uh, consultants get paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to do 50 state comparisons on a full kind of comprehensive scale. I did not do it on a full comprehensive scale. Um, what I did is I, I summarized the exemptions from those states uh, with the federal exemptions and then I give a uh, summary of that uh, in one of the third columns. I will go check on those copies um, when I have a chance. Uh, but you'll see that, that many of the states follow the federal exemptions uh, or very close to the federal exemptions. There are a couple of states like New Hampshire that don't at all. Um, so there are alternatives out there. I would say the majority follow the feds, but that is not the only model. Um. Yeah, and, and the other uh, questions? Uh, well, the, the questions that uh, Representative O'Brien wanted was to, to basically to elaborate on, on what the committee's charge is. And as Representative Sheldon noted, in the last meeting, 
many of your key questions follow the legislative charge. And so the memo that I drafted, and I'm sorry that it's on single-sided paper, again, IT hell, um, it, it lays that out and it follows the legislative charge and it elaborates on um, each of those provisions underneath the legislative charge. So the first a part of your legislative charge is whether the definition of wetlands should be amended, including whether the definition of wetlands under state wetlands law should be based on objective criteria such as size or location. So I'm not going to go into the substance of each of these. I explain each of the questions. And then I summarize those potential questions. On page four uh, of the memo, you'll see the first summary of potential questions. Should the definition of wetlands under state law remain the same, including whether significant wetlands should be determined according to review of the functions or values of the wetlands? Should the standard of whether a permit is required for activity be based on objective criteria similar to the standards employed by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers? And should the activities requiring a permit be narrowed or categorized according to distinct types of alterations similar to the A&R proposal? And then that leads into the next category of your legislative charge, the standard by which the state shall review a permit application for disturbance of a wetland or a wetland buffer. Again, I'll just go to the questions, which are on page six. Um, should the standard for issuing a permit for an activity in a wetland be set forth in statute or only included in rule? Right now, that standard is only in rule. Should the standard for denying a permit for an activity in a wetland be that the activity will have no undue adverse effect on the functions and values, which is what it is now under the rules, will have no under, undue adverse impact on functions and values, which is what is A&R is proposing in their legislation, draft legislation, or should it be some other standard? And if a proposed activity has an undue adverse effect or impact, should a person still be able to obtain a permit if they complete the mitigation sequence? The mitigation sequence is actions that a person can take if they're gonna have an undue adverse effect in order to get a permit. There's also something called compensation, part of the mitigation. If you do the mitigation sequence and you still can't meet the standard, you can do something called compensation underneath wetlands rules. But in the A&R legislative proposal, it's a little unclear whether compensation is an alternative. A&R is saying, yes, it is. It's part of the mitigation sequence. But that's not clear from the language that's proposed. So if a person cannot complete the mitigation sequence, can certain activities obtain a permit through use of compensation? If yes, should compensation be referenced in statute? And then the proposed exemptions. Michael, excuse me. Um, that, is that payment to a mitigation fund compensation? It, it's not necessarily. So compensation can, um, let me take you to, um, Uh, page five, in the third full paragraph down, it says what compensation measures may include. So compensation measures may include establishing new wetlands or enlarging the boundaries of an existing wetland to compensate for the adverse impact of the proposed activity. The compensation may also include payment of fees to a federal in lieu fee program or mitigation bank approved by the secretary. So then page seven, uh, the next question was proposed exemptions from regulation, uh, regulation of farming. And so the first, the, the summary of those questions is on page nine. Should the farming exclusion from the state definition of wetlands be retained so that areas that grow food or crops in connection with farming activities are outside ANR's jurisdiction or should growing of food or crops be subject to ANR authority but exempt from wetlands permitting. So remember, that's, that's part of the, the unique aspect of Vermont's definition of wetlands. It has that exclusion clause for, for areas that grow food or crops in connection with farming activities. And then regardless of whether the farming activity exclusion is retained or farming exemption adopted, what criteria should apply to qualify for the exclusion or the exemption? Should it apply to all farming? Uh, 
um, to growing of food or crops in connection with farming, should the definition of farming for the purposes of exclusion or exemption be retained as drafted under the A&R wetlands rules, or should it be consistent with Title VI, the RAPs, and Act 250, which is the broad definition of farming? Should there be limitations on the farming exclusion or exemption, such as the areas must have been in production in 1990, must be in ordinary rotation, or must comply with the RAPs? Um, those are all uh, conditions that are in the wetlands rules right now for the farming exclusion, uh, and the RAPs is for the farming exemption. And then last, should the allowed uses under the A&R wetlands rules be amended to be consistent with or more similar to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers dredge and fill permit exemptions <coughs> under state laws? And then the last is about permitting fees and what those permitting fees should be. The body of that, that subsection discusses how permitting fees are subject to a <coughs> state statute definition. They are supposed to be for services rendered. Um, the question is whether or not the permitting fees for wetlands permits are for services rendered, or are they also serving a regulatory disincentive um, incenting people not to disturb or conduct activities <coughs> in a wetland. Um, the agency says that the wetlands permitting fees are about all of the services that the wetlands program provides. It's not just about permitting. It's about pre-application review. It's about classification determinations. It's about wetland delineations. And that's what their permitting fee covers, not just the act of permitting itself. Um, which leads to some questions and that should the wetlands permitting fees be amended to more closely track the cost of permitting services provided by a &R personnel or should they be left as is to pay for the service of the wetlands program as a whole and to retain some incentive for persons to avoid wetland disturbance and whether certain activities should be exempt from permitting fees and if so what activities should be exempt or capped and what is an appropriate fee capped and should there be fees for the provision of other services provided by the wetlands program, including mapping, class determinations, and pre-application review? So there's a lot more detail in the memo about each of those subsections and, and what uh, all of those questions address. Um, but I think that's effectively a summary of what you need to do for your charge. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there are questions for Michael? at this time in regards to the issues. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Uh, so we have uh, Laura. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And you can just go to the three you just got. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thank you for having me this morning. My name is Laura LaPierre. I'm the Wetlands Program Manager in the Agency of Natural Resources. I've been the Program Manager for about six years, and um, our program is charged with administering the Vermont Wetland Rules and, and Wetland Statute. Uh, our experience is about 70 years, all told, combined with the six staff that I work with. Um, and we've been working with the current framework of regulations for about nine years now. Um, before I get into the details of functions and values, which I'm going to testify on today, I just want to give a bit more context. Oh, yeah, I'm not that tall. <laughs> um, so, Mike O'Grady has. Uh, submitted in testimony the documents called Alternative Wetlands Draft uh, Language uh, 1.1 that should be in your packets. And that's the, uh, the latest version of the ANR's draft statute, um, which we sent over to the State House last session. Um, this these changes were not, the, the genesis was not because of uh, issues with the agricultural exemption. 
actually. It wasn't because of issues with farmers and wetlands specifically. It was because um, we were we were looking at the program as a as a whole. We were received concerns. We've had capacity issues, issues with efficiencies and such. Um, agriculture is a very small subset of the the group that is regulated under the wetland rules because so much of it is exempt. For example, between 2016 and 2018. There were a total of 13 permits related to agriculture, and all told, we had over 300 permits in that time span. Um, so dealing with this issue with capacity and um, efficiency and clarity within the rules, we convened a stakeholder group which had around 11 meetings. Uh, from 2016 to 2018. We invited 30 individuals from all, um, from all aspects, environmental groups, uh, utility agencies, wetland consultants. Uh, we consistently got 20 people or so. Oh, yeah. Sorry, of hey. um, I wanted to just ask a question before you went on, if I could, please. So, yeah. uh, by the count, you're saying 13 of 300 permits were related to ag proposals. Yes. Can you characterize it in terms of acres? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't have that, that um, number on hand with me, but I can certainly follow up with that, with that I number. I didn't know if 13 and 300 is characterizes the land impact. It doesn't. It, it doesn't, but. Um, those those projects uh, weren't significantly greater in impact than those other uh, projects which we issued permits for, but I can I can get you more specifics on that for sure. Um, so. With that group, uh, there's actually several uh, individuals who are testifying today who were in the stakeholder group or their organization was a part of the stakeholder group. Art Gilman, John Groveman, Phil Huffman, Jeff Nelson. Karina Daly was in a special focus group on discussing classification of wetlands. Um, so you have a, a lot of great people today to ask questions, to hear their perspective on how you've gone about with changing the rules. Uh, so the proposal that went forward, it wasn't unanimous from this group that everybody wanted these changes. In general, though, folks were interested in the concept. You can, you can ask them yourselves. Uh, <clears throat> we have heard recently from a group of the stakeholders that they'd really like to con meet some more and hash out some of the details. Um, and I wanted to say that ANR is in support of, of doing that. Right now, we actually put a hold on any additional stakeholder meetings because of this committee. And Laura, of the 30-odd uh, people you said uh, that was on the focus group, um, of that group, uh, you mentioned three or four um, just recently. And they, uh, they seem to be all from the environmental groups uh, that kind of keep an eye on things like this. What, what other people might have been in, in attendance at these groups, uh, <clears throat> from farmers to uh, business people, developers? Uh, mm -hmm. Is there some of those folks? That Certainly. Um, I, we can provide a list of those individuals, but we had folks from the ski industry there. Um, the ag agency was present. We later added a couple of farmers to the group for our last meeting. Uh, the forestry sector was there. Um, the, there are a lot so, of people, yeah. As long as you provide us with a list, yeah. I'll okay. be fine. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah and I'll, I'll let the individuals who are testifying today explain a bit of their role, because um, there are certainly 
folks that are associated with environmental advocacy groups, but there's also people who are consultants who work for for developers primarily. Um, so going on to functions and values, I've provided this uh, sheet last session in the, la the, the four committees that you guys are associated with. The statistics are things that Julie went over, uh, Secretary Julie Moore went over last time. And I just wanted to provide this document again because this is how the wetland uh, functions and values are listed within the rules. Sorry they don't all show up on the screen for those who don't have it. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, more details on how wetlands provide these functions and values, how we assess them, and then loop it into uh, the agency's proposal for changes to the classification system. Uh, I'm hoping that these, this testimony will help the committee on two points that you're charged with. Uh, points one and two, one, whether wetland definition should be amended, including whether the definition of wetland under state wetlands law should be based on objective criteria such as size or location. And number two, the standard by which the state shall review a permit application for disturbance of a wetland or wetland buffer. Uh, so first, the, the basics, functions and values are uh, separate. Functions are self-sustaining properties that exist in the absence of society, such as uh, sediment retention of a wetland. That's something that's present whether or not a person cares about it or not. Um, values are have um, impact and interest with society, um, so it's, it's things that benefit society, like say you go paddling down the La Platte River and um, you see the wetlands and it has a lot of aesthetic value for you. Uh, so that has, um, that's more difficult to assess because it has to do with the person's convictions and one person may care more than another. Um, but that's why we care about wetlands. It's, it's, um, it's why we protect them. Uh, so why do wetlands provide more functions and values than upland areas on the landscape? It all has to do with the water. Um, uh, there's an intermediate level of water. We're not, there aren't streams, there are not deep water lake habitats. There's fluctuations in water levels and such. The water brings in nutrients um, and plants and animals, biota, uptake those nutrients, uh, allowing for a concentration of different species. The changes in the water levels causes disturbance, which allows for more biodiversity in those areas, more structure and uh, that structure creates more habitat and so provides a lot of these functions, fish habitat, wildlife, rare species, a lot of really rare things are adapted for wet habitat types. Uh, because there's a concentration of wildlife, people like to recreate in them and and uh, do research in those areas. Um, the, these, the other functions, flood control, water quality protection, erosion control, are all really an integral part in our TMDLs, our Lake Champlain and for Magog cleanup plans. Uh, we put in those plans that we have these wetland rules that are protecting those functions which allow for cleaner water. Uh, so we find it's really important not to roll back our regulations so that we're able to keep with our commitments with the EPA. Uh, so <laughs> wetlands, when they're not oversaturated with pollutants, do a really great job filtering and attenuating nutrients and sediments without any maintenance required. These are, these are natural systems. 
Uh, this is especially true for more natural wetlands, although managed wetlands do still provide these functions to an extent. Could, could, uh, could you tell us whether or not uh, is, is uh, rain, uh, I guess, input from mm -hmm. uh, has, seems to have gotten greater. We have more water than we used to. Is that floods the rivers and the rivers overflow? Mm -hmm. And it does, do we lose many wetlands because that silt from the rivers flood into wetland areas, which are usually low lying areas, and cause damage to the wetlands? Have you done that it's, study? Uh, it's, it's really dynamic. So you can have sediments that make it difficult. It can, it can mask the wetland characteristics. It can uh, raise the elevation above the water table so that it's now no longer a wetland. But certainly as the river moves, it creates other wetlands elsewhere as well because the sediment's being taken away from another location and deposited. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that the increase in precipitation is causing wetland <clears throat> loss overall. I think uh, there may even be more wetlands. Um, so when nutrients and sediments make their way into wetlands through those flood waters or um, from runoff, these wetland areas although not all wetlands are flat and bowl-shaped, those which are slow down the waters, the roughage from all of the biodiversity of trees and shrubs and, and grasses really slows down the water and allows sediments to drop out into the wetland area and not make their way back into the streams and rivers. Um, that biomass also uptakes the nutrients for while it's living, turns into trees and such. When those plants die, um, that leaf litter stays within the wetland. When you have less oxygen, it takes longer for organics like mm -hmm. leaf litter to, um, to come apart and allow the nutrients to leave the system. So, you know, organics is a really important part of how um, wetlands hold phosphorus, as well as, as carbon, too. I have uh, a quick question, sorry, from that one. So, uh, if, does it reach some sort of steady state, though, so that I mean, it may be a slower cycle, but as much comes in, it's going to end up leaving? Saturate that you can certainly saturate a system. Yeah. Um, is that a normal endpoint for what? No, if, if you're not receiving a lot of pollutants, wetlands are able to filter and use that. Some of the um, nutrients leave the system uh, from plants and animals leaving the wetland and such. Um, but there are places in Vermont where the wetlands are oversaturated with nutrients just like a lake or a stream, and they're not able to provide that function as much. Um, although if they were, they were gone, there'd be a lot more going into the system as well. Um, so it's, it's, it's dynamic, there's definitely nutrients coming and going from the wetland. Overall, we're seeing more nutrients staying within the wetland. And um, there's a lot to consider. pH, uh, the amount of iron in the soil, the amount of oxygen, so how long the wetland is flooded or not flooded, makes a big difference. And uh, UVM is actually working on figuring out what the exact ways that we can dial in how we do wetland restoration so that we are improving our ability to attenuate nutrients like phosphorus as much as possible. Um, I want to make the point too that wetlands with managed vegetation also provide these water quality functions if they're allowed to persist. 
They might not be as, as beautiful or have any recreational value, but they're still providing these water functions. Um, they could recover naturally over time if left alone, or they can be actively restored to provide greater function and value, such as NRCS or Fish and Wildlife Service providing payments to landowners to do restoration work. I could um, keep going on, on functions and values, but I'll move on to uh, talking about how we assess functions and values. And, and I want to make the point, uh, because we are looking at whether we want to align more with the Army Corps of Engineers, um, seeing what they do. And, and they assess function and value as well. This is uh, a couple pages from their book of um, the highway methodology, which has been in place for a long time. Um, and they use this for their regulatory program. It is, um, it's not a numeric test. You don't get a 10 for water quality function or anything that, like that. It's, it's qualitative. And that's because there's really no good system for um, giving specific quantifications yet for wetland function and value. It doesn't mean that they're not important. It just means that it's, it's difficult to assess. So um, you know, there is definitely professional judgment involved with this assessment. But on a national level, this is how we're assessing and protecting wetlands, not just within Vermont. So for comparison, I've, I've given you our wetland evaluation form uh, that we've been using for a very long time within the wetlands program. It's had some changes over the years. Um, <laughs> But it's basically a checklist of um, physical characteristics of a wetland, looking at the, the wildlife, looking at where it is on the landscape, and using all of those criteria in conjunction with one another to determine whether the wetland is significant. Um, so I'll give you an example of a wetland for us to work through this sheet. So say we have a coniferous forested wetland, a cedar swamp. It's two acres in size, it's really bowl shaped. There are many small streams coming into it and just one coming out. Um, there are no large bodies of water upstream of this wetland and there's property downstream along, uh, along the stream about a quarter mile away. So if we look at the point one, water storage for flood water and stormwater runoff, you see that you know, there's a constricted outlet, like what I described as something that shows that the water is being held back for some time. There's physical space for flood water. There are streams present. Um, we can look at whether we think it's at a lower level, say if there is a lot of um, upstream flood storage, maybe it's, it's functioning at a lower level in the landscape, however that's not the case here. And it is considered a higher level of flood storage if there's uh, potential for damaging public or private property, um, which is the case of this wetland. So, I would call this, this uh, cedar swamp significant in flood storage function. If we look back at uh, the way the wetland rules were in place before 2010, this wetland wouldn't have been protected because it wasn't on our maps and we only protected wetlands that were mapped, right? And coniferous uh, Wetland areas are difficult to find on aerial interpretations, so this one wasn't picked up by the mapping system. Today, we have the presumptions of significance. So this wetland is not mapped, but it has, uh, it's over half an acre in size, it's connected to a stream, um, so it's 
presumed to be class two, somebody could petition for it to be class three and not regulated by the wetland rules. Um, but that's generally how we do things today. Um, now, with the federal definition of wetlands, it's very different. There's waters of the US. Um, and I just wanted to take a moment to explain how there's, there's a lot of proposals for revising the waters of the United States, what's actually protected federally, which would uh, reduce protections to headwater streams and smaller wetlands that are providing functions and values. Um, I do see the value in aligning with the Army Corps where it makes sense, um, but we need to make sure that we're not tying our jurisdiction too closely to um, pieces of federal law that are in flux um, and may not be protecting Vermont values for wetlands. Um, and. The proposal that ANR has put forward um, still protects the functions and values of, of wetlands. Um, I really like the concept of the way the rules are set in place now, that we're only protecting wetlands that are significant in function. Um, significance is a 10-page test that takes a really long time. We get over 600 inquiries a year, people saying, is this wetland protected? Do I need a permit or do I not? Um, that it can, you know, going out to the site and looking at it, um, we might be able to give them an answer uh, in a half hour. We may need to go back to our, our desk or get more information from the consultants in order to figure out the classification. What we'd really like to be able to do is have a quicker answer to which wetlands are protected under the rules so we can focus more time and energy on educating people about wetland protections and doing restoration projects within <coughs> DDC. Do, do you have people on board that to take care of this type of questions? And, and you know, if you have 300 people you must have more than 300 apply for permits if you issue more than 300 permits. Some of them must get rejected uh, to some degree. So do you have people on board that can uh, do a, a quick response uh, or answer questions for people that call you or have you come in? Yeah, we, we do a lot of interactions one-on-one -on -one with landowners to help them understand where their wetlands might be on their property and whether or not it's protected. Um, we do that today. We could focus more on helping people understand where their wetlands are um, if we're spending less time doing functions and values assessments before the permitting step. So what, the, what? Can I follow up a little? I'm yeah. wondering how many staff do you have committed to helping the public with these inquiries? We have six. Thank you. And can I ask a question about, just make sure I understand what you were saying. So in terms of aligning the federal law, mm -hmm. the uh, Vermont, is the situation that we have to at least meet the federal standards like the Water Act or something like that? but we can have um, rules, regulations that are ending seeding some of that. Right. It's like a, that's the minimum level for what we must do. There's, there's no minimal level for what we, well there, there is because of our commitments to the EPA that we need to continue to protect wetlands to the level that we have been as a state. State regulation, unlike some other environmental regulations, uh, state wetland regulation is completely separate from federal. So we um, don't necessarily protect the same wetlands today as what the, the federal government does. Uh, and we also have the addition of wetland buffer zones that are protected that 
the federal government does not. So can you say whether we're more protective or less protective than what would occur under federal law? It depends on the wetland. Um, if it's a wetland that we didn't find significant, then we're not protecting it in the federal government, maybe. Um, when it comes to protections for functions and values, we have um, that more seeded into our permitting requirements than, than, the, than the federal government. They're more focused on water quality and, and navigation, whereas we can, we can focus more on endangered species and, and things like that, not that, not that they don't. Um, but it's, it's more baked into our wetland rule instead of being a separate rule. Can I, uh, just to clarify slightly, um, the, the federal government, can you say your name? I'm sorry, um, I'm Hannah Smith with the Agency of Natural Resources. The federal government still operates in Vermont. Uh, they're, they're, we don't have any delegated authority over the 404 yeah. program. So the two regulatory programs are separate, but are both operating here. It's not the way we've assumed EPA's authority to administer the um, point source discharge program. So what we're describing is um, two separate regulatory programs that are both operating in Vermont, and there are distinctions between the jurisdiction that they take. But because we have a wetlands program here, it doesn't, it doesn't the Army Corps is still also regulating wetlands in the state. And the last clarification you said, Vermont's status in terms of how you regard significance of a wetland. If you say your default now is class two, if it hasn't been mapped, it hasn't been enumerated yet, you'll assume a, a class two designation and that, that changed recently. Yeah, so in twenty ten the regulations changed so that the the agency of natural resources could reclassify wetlands to class two, which were not on previously on the Vermont significant wetlands inventory maps. Um, and the way it's been functioning is we have a list of presumptions of significance. Things like the, the wetland is over half an acre in size, you should presume that it's class two and protected. If it's connected to a stream and there's a lot of herbaceous vegetation, nearby, then that's presumed to be significant. If it's a vernal pool, providing a feeding habitat, on and on. Um, they're presumed to be protected and we protect them. Uh, somebody could specifically request a classification of that wetland. They can um, argue that it's class three, go through this uh, checklist and say this, this wetland is not significant in function, and we have a petition process for that. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> I guess I want to understand um, really well what's why A and R is making this proposal to us. And I yeah. think what I heard you say was that you would like more capacity for staff to proactively identify wetlands, and if you make this process maybe more streamlined, that would allow that to happen. But doesn't the very fact that you're responding to these requests also identify significant wetlands? And that you're actually a, you're actually working on the ones that are potentially most at risk because they are, um, there's a, de a development that's triggering the inquiry. So this is kind of high grading the process for you. In terms of prioritizing which wetlands to get on the map, <coughs> if you will, or mm -hmm. identify. Yes, but we feel that there is a, a faster way at getting at which wetlands are protected by taking the that list of presumptions of significance and just saying, uh, you know, with some minor tweaks in the language that's in the bill, um, these wetlands are class two, and that's how they should be treated. Um, so that consultants who know how to delineate the edge of the wetland, can provide their clients with more um, information on which wetlands they need to avoid and minimize impacts for. And we can, we can shift some of our resources on some of the other inquiries that we receive. 
uh, the way the presumptions are set out is it may or may not be significant. It may or may not be protected. If somebody comes in there with a bulldozer and we're not able to do the 11 point test at that point because we didn't see the wetland ahead of time, it makes it difficult for us to say, well, this was actually a significant wetland and we need to clean this up. We need to restore this wetland. Um, it's a lot easier to say this wetland is, was over half an acre looking at um, aerial photography, digging in and just seeing where the organic layer begins. Um, it's an, it would be an easier test for us to be able to go forward and um, get res restoration happening on sites where um, people did not ask the question on what, whether or not they had a protected wetland. And how often do you find that destruction of the wetland occurring prior to an inquiry? Um, most of the violations that we find are, are instances where someone did not ask us if they had a wetland first. And how often does that happen? Um, I, can, I can get you the, the report of, of complaints and, and those that turned up to be actual violations. We get one to five complaints a week. Um, they're not all violations. A lot of, you know, sometimes we can't confirm whether or not they're violations because of the destruction that has occurred. I think I have one more. I, I just, I'm sorry. One more. One more. I just want to know how many wet, like, if we have a finer sieve, we have a, a process that identifies more functions than the federal process. It's one thing I also just heard you say. What would be lost by aligning more closely with the federal standard? Um, clarity would be one. Uh, be, because they're, they're, um, working on revising which waters are protected on, and uh, we've been in, in flux for about 20 years with which wetlands are, are actually protected. But the, the whole intent of, of this group is to try to get some clarity for our people in the state of Vermont so they know who's in charge, who they should call. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I would say our clarity isn't too good. And, uh, and that's part of our charge is to try to develop clarity to our own regs because we have federal people that do in, they say you're fine to go. We have the ag agency that goes and they say that it's fine to go. Then we have A and R that comes along and says, "Oh no, no, you can't do this. You should have called us before them." And I mean, we we're struggling with clarity ourselves, and uh, so that's the purpose of of what one thing we're supposed to help straighten out here, Chris. I thought I heard you say something about our obligation to the EPA through our TMDL agreement uh, obligates us to not have a weaker standard of protection. So I'm curious, does that mean that through this process and if we land with the bill that the governor signs, then it will be reviewed by the EPA or we just self-certify or, or can you just explain that a little bit? It's the first time I've heard that kind of. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure how that <coughs> process would play out. We're not, we're not there yet, but um, I think, I just wanted to really emphasize that these changes have implications for, for greater water quality uh, issues well, within the state. Okay, is it fair yeah. to start at the top level and say that as it stands now, the EPA would not permit us to become more lax on our wetland regulation? I don't know the answer to that. I think this is Hannah Smith again. The, the reference to the TMDL, um, the loading is based on current land uses in the state. And so the concern is that any kind of 
change to land use or land use regulation that happened quickly would alter the, map, uh, the modeling that went into determining the loading for each lake segment. The EPA wouldn't re review our state wetlands permitting program for compliance. It would just be the modeling. I think everybody in the room is, is completely committed to having clarity. The question is, what are we going to recommend? That, that there be no disturbing of wetlands, or that these be the loopholes that are committed to develop in wetlands? And once you make that distinction, then it's time for clarity. But to, until you make a distinction, there's nothing to make clear. So where do we go? Well, we, we certainly discussed that um, in the stakeholder group is there's, you know, some regulations have like hard and fast rules. Yes, no. That's clear. Then there's, well, we want flexibility so that we can live on the landscape of Vermont. Um, and that's where the wetland rules has a lot of flexibility to consider specific projects and see which projects would not harm the functions and values of the wetlands. And so that's where all the complexity comes, which makes it less clear. The stakeholder group was not interested in a hard and fast, stay away from all wetlands approach um, because <laughs> It's, you don't always know where your wetlands are, and it can make it really difficult to um, do anything in Vermont. Um, do to, to do any building. It can on make wetlands. it. On wetlands. On wetlands. If you have our fast rule. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> uh, John? Uh, Laura, on the, regarding wetlands, what's the relationship between the EPA and, and the Army Corps? Do they have you know, one the enforcement body or like you were talking about? Yeah. The rules have been in flux and so yeah. I didn't understand if the Army Corps has certain rules and that changes administration to administration or the it's the EPA really. So they're they're working under the Clean Water Act together. Uh, Army Corps is the regulatory entity. They approve, deny permits. Um, do the more thorough or do, or do all of the assessments. The EPA um, provides guidance documents on how they do that work and they also have veto power if they feel that a project should not go forward. Okay. Thank you. Are you having more? Um, oh, I, I just uh, want to and on two points, one that the the list of for changing the definition of class two is based off the off of the presumptions of significance, which the program has been administering for nine years now, and <clears throat> finds that in a lot of instances those wetlands are significant. It's a coarser filter. You may end up with some wetlands that would be protected with a more thorough analysis not protected and vice versa. You might end up with some class threes protected. But ultimately, we would still be doing the thorough functions and values analysis within the permitting uh, review process. I wanted to, to just mention that I'll be here for the rest of the meeting. So if any other questions come up, feel free to ask. Uh, Chris? One quick question on the federal document that you showed us that said how our weapon functions and values apply to the regulatory program. There's one section in there that's bolded and it talks about a selection of the least environmentally damaging practical, practical alternative. So uh, can you just explain how mm -hmm. that works? And it's, it's a slightly other fess up, it's a slightly worrisome phrase, and it sounds like uh, damage will be committed, but we're looking for the least damaging. Uh, yeah, so that's that's in their, their mitigation sequence, yeah. and um, that part of their regulation means that if you have uh, significant impacts to a water resource, that you need to look for alternative sites 
and assess the in environmental harm if the project was conducted on those sites as well to demonstrate that um, they tried to avoid and minimize impacts <clears throat> and this is the site that they ended up proposing for their project which may have impacts to wetlands and then it goes to the next step of if there are is harm to wetland function and value then you need to mitigate offset those impacts by creating or restoring wetlands elsewhere how often do they ever just say or do they ever say the answer is no we're not we're not uh, going down we're not going to allow damaging impacts even if they're the least I haven't seen a um, Army Corps denial of a permit um, in, in Vermont since I've been manager. There have been some very long, lengthy discussions of pushing for, for further analysis to reduce impacts, however. Yep. Harvey? Yeah, so on this uh, yep. little sheet you have on the back side, you have uh, exempt uh, wetland and uh, you know, you're talking about the, the farmer's exemption and one spot you have an excess road no permit is needed and the other area is that access road needs a permit. Mm -hmm. now, some of these roadways have been in existence for a very, very long period of time. Most of the farmers don't know uh, where the wetland is and where it is on that property. So, what's the process for? Uh, I I assume looking at this that every farmer would need to get a hold of your department to have their property assessed, delineated. Uh, what, what what's the process that we follow? Uh, so, if if you're doing a construction project where you're putting in a permanent structure, new new structure, not continuing to have a structure in place through a wetland, um, there is an assessment of whether or not you have wetlands on the site. That's something that the program can help out with. You can also uh, meet with a consultant in some instances if you are uh, have um, crop insurance you can have uh, NRCS go out to the site and assess the wetland. So you mentioned the insurance companies. I, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to follow this through. Um, go into a little more detail on how the, you know, the crop insurance would impact well, NR NRCS has federal crop insurance. Um, I understand that maybe next meeting they're invited potentially to, to testify. Um, so I would definitely defer to them. But if someone's enrolled in an NRCS program, they have to follow the wetland protection policy. And so they have technical staff that help <coughs> farmers um, find where the wetlands are so that they can their wetlands. So they, they come out and delineate the property? They will, yes. They, they will. <laughs> for, for crop insurance? Uh, the, if they're enrolled in an NRCS program, which includes crop insurance. But I thought that land that was uh, farmed was exempt, so I, I, I'm not making the connection with crop insurance. Yeah, There's so crop on there, so I'm thinking that that area would be exempt. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's exempt while it's growing food and crop. It's not exempt when you want to um, fill in the wetland area under the wetland rules. And herein lies a lot of the discussions that we've had. Is NRCS is a separate entity with their own wetland protection policy that is different from state um, exemptions. So, so does this fall back on the southwest, the swampless, the provision where we have prior converted ag lands and farm wetlands? Yes. And, and we know where those are. So, if those are prior converted lands, they're exempt? 
There's a distinction between the federal regulation yeah. and the state, and I think what I'm hearing is the feds would be um, responsible for this change in, in use and have to evaluate it. Well, I'm trying to understand that part. Yeah, me too. I'm trying me, to help. So, yeah, I got it. Yeah, and I'm, I'm um, best first in state regulations and, and not federal regulations, and it sounds like you guys are going to be having federal entities come on and um, I encourage you to ask these questions. So it sounds to me like they might be conflicting regulations. Yeah, they're different. Uh, different. The um, ASCS could come in and cite a bunker silo in a particular location, and, and they have to comply with all the federals. Then A and R could go in under the way the bill's written, I believe. To, well, no, they were, that's not right for our rules. You've got to do it this way. Or, you know, and it, it, isn't, it doesn't serve anyone um, any purpose to have conflicting state, federal, regulators having different opinions and somebody's paying the bill and it's usually the feds that are cost sharing all these things and uh, it, it costs a lot more money if you start redesigning and changing things. The ag agency usually in, in these projects is their boots are on the ground with ASCS and and they're there to uh, help steer that farmer through a process that's acceptable. Carol? So this conversation that we're having right now is one of the reasons why I felt it was really clear that we should have the study group and why we included it in our mm -hmm. bill. Um, there's a lot of confusion. I'm not, I'm not pointing my, my remark to you. I'm just saying to the entire committee and anybody out there that this is why I really felt we needed clarification because there is a lot of confusion. It, um, it adds to a lot of delay in terms of what farmers want to do, which you know, are particularly pro uh, potentially projects that will improve water quality, improve soil health, and if we can just get to the bottom of this, this is this is one of my. If somebody asked what our goals were in this process, that's one of my goals. That's my major goal here. Certainly, yes. today you know we've we've done a lot of work coordinating with NRCS and the Army Corps and. This is where we're at. So yep. certainly, there may be places within our rules that um, could improve the situation. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you, Lori. Okay. Um, we have um, Ms. Bailey. sometimes after the fact, and provide environmental testimony to Act 250 and Act 248 land permitting. I am a nationally certified wetland scientist as well as a New Hampshire certified wetland scientist. I believe we all live, want to live in Vermont for the same reasons. It's a beautiful place, and of all the places I've worked as a scientist, including Wyoming, Idaho, Montana, and Utah, 
I have considered myself lucky to live in a state with the environmental planning foresight that Vermont has. As a consultant, I recognize that this doesn't come without out its own headaches and burdens, financial and emotional, to landowners, developers, single family homeowners, municipalities, and farmers. But I also think that the project is ultimately stronger as a result of these rules. Typical wetland issues might include a client's surprise in learning that their roadside commercial lot is predominantly a class two wetland. Or a complete lack of understanding of what a wetland is. The iconic cattail swamp is usually much more obvious than a forested hillside seep or a seasonal floodplain forest. After educating them about their land's natural resources, there is the effort to explain and interpret the wetland rules, federal and state, that are applicable. And in some cases, this may mean explaining to them that they just built their driveway across a large, unmapped, jurisdictional class two wetland without a permit. Or that it is unlikely that they would get approval to convert their 40 acre forested wetland into hemp or corn production. Obviously, for many landowners, this news can be frustrating, or even devastating. What is the disconnect that allows people to go so far down a path to land development before they are hit with understanding the natural resources that exist on their parcel? I believe the disconnect is lack of wetland and water resource education, and lack of accurate wetland mapping. As a consultant, it is my job to advise clients to the best of my ability, and that means understanding the project goals from the perspective of the landowner, providing sound data as a scientist, and recognizing how local, state, and federal regulations apply to their project. It is true that the wetlands world can be dynamic and not always well-defined, and there are certainly some changes that could be implemented into the Vermont Wetland Program to simplify, improve responsiveness, and clarity. But overall, the rules as I interpret them are solid, and people are beginning to recognize that they exist. It goes without saying that clients are used to having to pay for engineering design and permit fees for wastewater and stormwater infrastructure associated with development. The same needs to be true for natural resource impact, including wetlands. If we want to continue to live in Vermont, where we fish, hunt, farm, hike, and ski, then we need to accept that development of any kind, there is a concurrent natural resource impact to that we need to be accountable for. We are gathered today to study the Vermont wetland rules, while a working group also exists in this session focused on water quality funding. And a portion of Act 64 includes a program that provides farms with financial assistance to address water quality. These measures make it seem like we are all trying to do the right thing, but we may need to work harder to see the connections across the landscape. I am familiar with the results of the Wetland Working Group, the stakeholder committee that was formed in 2016 to work with DC to provide clarification to the Vermont Wetlands Regulations, and I have requested copies of that document to be shared with you. It's entitled Draft Vermont Wetlands Stakeholder Update. Um, I believe that you guys have copies of that. Looks like this. No. <coughs> this report identifies the two year effort that was made to clarify the Vermont wetland rules and improve predictability and accountability. These concepts were distilled into the wetland statutory proposal and the latest version of the last session's bill to amend the Vermont wetland rules. The bill provides improved consistency in the wetland definition, clarity in the class two determination, and added detail to the agricultural exemption. Most importantly, I hope DC, DEC will continue to work in partnership with the Vermont community to educate the general public including Vermont youth, to improve the overall understanding of what defines a wetland and the ecosystem services wetlands provide, and expand statewide wetland mapping to include not only remote sensing, but ground truthing in the form of wetland assessments and confirmed delineations. Implementing these preventive measures to our existing wetlands should help to alleviate after the fact violations, restoration, and regulatory distrust. 
thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys might have for me. Did you submit your written testimony? I did not. Would you be able to do that? I can do that. Thank you. Roll call. <laughs> Thank you. This is helpful. Could you could you help me understand in your work how often are, are you sort of 50 50 that you're pulled in after the fact to help somebody navigate a situation where they are in violation or are you ahead? I'm just trying to understand the scale yeah. of what we're I, facing here. I would say that I'm. Um, 80 ahead of the game, 20 after the fact, so less. And has that been consistent over your career? Or? Um, in Vermont, I would say it has. I would say that I'm getting more requests um, at the forefront now from municipalities that are learning more about wetlands regulations, attorneys, real estate agents. Um, so there is an effort to you know, for me to be the first person on the ground, right. um, which saves a lot of frustration later. Thank you. And that 20%, are they people that are just willy-nilly going and doing it, or are they people that haven't heard about it, that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, are yeah. doing it by air? I really think that the majority of them are people that honestly didn't know that they were in a wetland. So that's why yeah, we need to do problem. more outreach and mm -hmm. education. Mm -hmm. and 80, 20 is pretty good. Yeah, and it, it varies seasonally, I'm sure, but I think that's... Uh, Chris? So as a practitioner out yeah. there seeing a wide variety of projects, uh, I'm asked, this is an impressionistic question, but do you feel like how are we doing on wetlands management? I know we're working on clarity and conflict between <laughs> rules and mm -hmm. permitting and all that, but in terms of your sort of a report card on environmental health and impacts of wetlands, are we gaining, losing, treading water? How, would you, how do you look at that world that you work in? And, and I think, again, this is the mapping issue is we, we don't have all, there are so many wetlands in Vermont that are not mapped. <laughs> and, and those will never be mapped until there is a lot of ground truthing related to them or you know, you're know you required to submit your shape file of the boundary with your permit. But, um, so you know, the 4% of mapped wetlands that we have in Vermont, that's one measure. Um, and of that, I think we're, we're maintaining. Any other questions? Um, so you just you said you, right now you're not required to submit the shape file of a map wetland that happens through a permit process, unless there is a determination on that wetland at the same time. So yes, if the wetland has been unmapped as a class, if it's um, if if a determination has not been previously made on that wetland, um, then you are required to submit the shape file. Whether that that shape file is not necessarily being added to the VSWI mapping layer that we all use um, in a seasonal capacity, so so yes, and and I think part of that is the recognition that wetlands change and you have to have a redelineation every five years. But you know, there's so much data that I've collected in 11 years here that if that were on those maps, it would be much more visually helpful. Thank you. Why, why isn't it put on the maps? I think it's lack of funding, a uh, lack of time. I have not enough people. There's only six of them in the state. And the Army Corps doesn't require it at all. Any other questions, uh, Harvey? Uh, I thought I heard you say, uh, as far as the loss of wetlands, we were kind of holding mm -hmm. steady mm -hmm. the wetlands. When we had a presentation at the first meeting, um, it says, uh, and I think this was the Secretary of A&R, we've lost uh, 
35% of our wetlands since 1980. And uh, I know you can't answer the question, but at some point I hope this committee digs into that a little bit and, and kind of documents how many wetlands we lost, how do we know we've lost them, where they're located, what watersheds mm -hmm. are in. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. I think that would be very helpful for this committee. I see that even as a, another GIS layer of, of the impact, an impact layer, so that we could ultimately overlay wetlands maps with wetlands developed and, and cut it out. So. Any other questions of Matt? So if, if we're going to find out and gain more information about what is actually going on, are we gonna, what are we going to do in the meantime? Are we going to have a moratorium, a timeout, or are we going to... Uh, wait for all the information to come in and meanwhile conduct business as usual. What would this committee recommend? Are you asking me or asking me? I'm, I'm saying I think that that's the sort of the witness has shared with us the dilemma that's before us. Which is to say um, we're going to go with the status quo until we have evidence that it's that the status quo is inadequate and not serving us well. Or we're going to say um, until we answer this question, which may be a determinate question, what are we going to do? Well, I, I don't think it's fair to ask the witness that question. I think. Oh, I think I, I was. Think that's I think that's the mean. question that the witness is posing, the challenge that is being posed to us, and um, I conclude based on the witness's testimony. So, but thank that, you. that's why we were appointed to this special committee to try to weigh that out and come up with suggestions to present to our fellow legislators. So, so uh, you know, I think that's our decision. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, We're running quite a bit behind. Art, uh, would you like yeah. to come up? Sure. Karina is a hard act to follow. Um, so my name is Art Gilman. I am the principal of a business called Gilman and Briggs Environmental Incorporated, located in Barrie. We've had about 30 years of experience uh, with uh, wetland regulations. Uh, in fact, I was actually a consultant prior to the 1990 rules, which shows my gray hair here. Um, so I've been at it a long time and have, have worked both with the state and with the core uh, over those over those many years with many different clients, uh, utility companies, municipalities, private developers, landowners who uh, just want driveways, things like that. Uh, I will say I've had relatively little experience with the agricultural community, largely because they have been exempt uh, from many of the sorts of projects that I am involved with, you know, uh, development projects or, or uh, transportation projects, bridges, and things like that. So I can't, ex can't talk too much directly about agriculture. Uh, but I would say, and I think one of the points that not just myself, but other people I've spoken with and the, uh, the, the uh, working group that we had those 11 meetings with, I think most people agree that the definition of weapon that the federal uh, agencies have come up with, which is done as a result of the Clean, Clean Water Act, is a very good definition. And we should retain that definition of what a wetland is, which is a scientific explanation <coughs> of, of what wetlands are. That's federal. That's the federal, federal. and that's the one that the, uh, the proposed rule uh, would align with. The one, the proposed rule that the uh, agency has has submitted, that would align that with the federal rule. Um, that has had nationwide experience 
uh, for more than 30 years. I think it was adopted in 1984. And it's good anywhere in the country. It, scientists can understand it. They can apply the three criteria of soils, plants, and wetness to determine whether something is a wetland or not. Clarity is a little more difficult to achieve when you talk about not what a wetland is, but what the jurisdiction is. The, uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has jurisdiction over all wetlands that are, uh, they, there's a small category they, they exclude called uh, isolated wetlands, quite a small category. But otherwise, they have jurisdiction over wetlands. And they, even though they um, interpret functions and values, they don't rely on functions and values for their jurisdiction. Their jurisdiction is placement of dredged or fill material in waters of the United States, including adjacent wetlands. So that is their jurisdiction. And they're very clear as to what their jurisdiction is. The state's jurisdiction is based on the functions and values. As Laura pointed out, there's a long 10 or 11 page form to fill out uh, now to determine whether it is uh, jurisdictional or not. And the proposed change would be meet the presumptions uh, are final. In other words, if you presume it is, then it is. With the possibility of petitioning to show that it is not really, and then you change the classification after that. So that's the uh, that's the clarity on the definitions versus the jurisdiction between the two. As Laura stated, they are separate. People in Vermont have to go to both the state and the core if they want to have a project that includes wetlands. Uh, so they're largely overlapping, but they're not totally overlapping. So should they be more in line with each other? I have felt that in general, the Corps does not permit things that the state would not permit. In other words, we frequently have projects where we need both permits and we get them both, one from the state and one from the core. One of the major differences is that the state has the 50-foot buffer zone around a jurisdictional wetland, which the core does not have. The core's jurisdiction stops at the wetland boundary, but the state's jurisdiction for a significant wetland extends 50 feet outside the wetland with the idea that we want to protect the wetlands. And if you, uh, you know, build your buildings right up to the edge of the wetland, then that's not, they can be subject to uh, degradation uh, because the buffer zone isn't protected around. So there is clarity uh, in terms of the definitions and generally in terms of the um, jurisdictions, but um, the people who know the clarity are the regulatory people and not the people who are being regulated. Not the fire, the right. right. So I think that's perhaps what uh, Karina was going to, was that we do need more education on what wetlands are and uh, how to recognize them and uh, how to deal with them. So it obviously is a difficult task because a lot of people are not interested in them particularly, and uh, uh, they may have motives where they, you know, that we just need to, we just need to get across to that field, so we just need to put that road in to do it, and not really thinking about the fact that it may be a jurisdictional thing. So, <clears throat> it's a, it is an extremely complicated situation, and. Uh, as Karina says, sometimes we get after the fact, we have to get after the fact permits for somebody and so forth. And occasionally we see violations. Uh, once in a while we see violations that are pretty intentional <laughs> violations. I think people knew that they were, were filling well as they were not supposed to. So 
it, it, it's a big it's a big step to learn and understand um, these various things. So I can understand why the committee may. <laughs> Carol, All right, would you just say again what you did regarding the Army Corps? Um, not not so much function as values, but. Their jurisdiction is the placement of dredged or fill material in waters of the United States, including adjacent wetlands. Okay. And um, it's not so much of a problem, not so much of an issue here in Vermont, where most of our wetlands are adjacent, either physically adjacent to a stream or biologically connected. Um, the, 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 there's been court cases decided by the Supreme Court uh, over the course of time, uh, pushing back against the feds, against the, the core for what their definitions mean and so forth. And uh, I guess the, there are two that were sort of the, the major ones. And Mike Adams from the core can, can describe these to you. But in general, it's a, not a, it's, it's an uncommon situation where the core in the state, in the state of Vermont, would say that uh, it is not an adjacent wetland and they, they don't have jurisdiction. Most of those cases would, in my experience, be uh, in, not significant wetlands as <coughs> functions and values analysis that the state uses. So I, I don't think that is a very real concern uh, in Vermont that the Corps does not regulate a lot of wetlands. Thanks. John? So the definition of, of waters of the U.S. then? Yes. Um, it's not, it's, it's sort of, does that include well, as it's waters? Well, as it's, as it's currently construed, and this may be the what's sort of uh, the current administration's possibility of change, is that uh, it extends to um, if there's a uh, s significant uh, nexus to a navigable water. And it's cur currently construed by the core as including all permanent streams and intermittent streams that uh, flow to the permanent streams and the adjacency to any of those, to adjacency to intermittent and any perennial stream. The definition of stream is a little iffy, uh, but in general, um, anything with a bed and bank configuration and a mineral bottom is, an inter is a stream, whether there's water flowing in it today or not. And you can go on to many hillsides in the state of Vermont and find these small streams that you know, you can see the bed and bank configuration and uh, not, a, not a leaf lined bottom, but a sand or gravel bottom, rock bottom. Any, any other questions for our? I, I have a quick question about the buffers. Um, yeah. You know, we've heard elsewhere that wetlands are not, um, that they move and shift a little bit. Yes. Does that, um, is that where some of the logic around the buffers comes in, and do you think? No, I think mostly the logic of the buffers was that, um, uh, particularly for wildlife habitat, wildlife frequently walk around the edge of the wetland, and they they're, they're, they want to be in, there's a lot of resources in the wetland, but a lot of wildlife trails are right around the edge, and you want to protect the cover. You want to. You want to protect the overhanging shade for fish habitat. You want to have, um, you know, a, a place where the uplands can attenuate pollution coming into the wetlands, uh, things like that. So it's really, a, it's not, it's <clears throat> not uh, based on the potential movement of the wetland boundaries. Yeah. And, and and so, you you mentioned that this is a distinction between federal and state. Yes. But it sounds like you think maybe we're on, it's a, a we're, wise distinction. We're more, we're more protective of wetlands than the federal people are, yes. Yeah. And I 
in the, as a as a consultant, is it harder to get one permit than the other, or is it um, all fairly simple, very difficult? The I I guess I would say I haven't disagreed with any of the decisions made by the state or the Corps. Uh, I think they both do their jobs very well and when they decide to issue permits, the ones that they do issue. Um, they both generally use the same uh, phrase we heard before, the mitigation sequence. In other words, um, and going towards the least environmentally damaging practical <coughs> alternative. Under both regimes, um, there's a requirement to um, avoid it if you can, in other words, don't go in the wetlands if you can, or minimize the wetland, which oftentimes we see, for example, in uh, side slopes of roads. You know, bring your road in tighter and don't have wide slopes. Um, pull your pull your development back out of the wetland or even out of the buffer zone as far as you can, and still make and still have it a viable project. Um, and in general, I sometimes it seems like the, the core has a different process, and it's faster usually uh, because they are uh, they have a deadline in their rules of the time frame. Once you submit a uh, complete application, the core has a deadline, so it is generally faster. The state has been. Up and down. I once gra uh, graphed the times that it took to get the various permits of uh, the state wetlands permits in our office, and it varied wide, quite widely. Occasionally, as little as uh, six to eight weeks, and uh, once was more than a year. But Did under you the say a year, more than a year in one in one instance. Um, but. That particular one was in the uh, early 1990s. No, but you're correct. Uh, I, that was 10 or 12 years ago that I did that. But I would say that it's not, it's not just the regulatory office that's dealing with it. Vermont law uh, requires a 30-day public notice. Um, so there's 30 days baked in that is not baked into the core. So, um, you know, so, you know, the, the, road, the wrong way is to notify people and uh, it's not big. Farmer anymore. feeding animals or growing crops would do real well waiting a year to get a I can't speak to that. All I know is I, that I know that the agency is struggling with, uh, with their efficiency and, and as Laura said, they want to make it simpler so that they can be more efficient. Hopefully we can help. Yes. Other questions? Did Chris, did you have some? No. No? Uh, thank you. Uh, Jackie, did you want to testify at this time or um, next meeting? I can. I also understand that you're going to be done with time. So I will be here all day if you'd like to continue to the next witness. And if you have time, can I can do that. Sure. Or come uh, back to the next time. Well. Um, hey, I guess we, um, I think, uh, uh, I think we have time, uh, uh, because the next issue is, um, we may be getting a cart before the horse and we need to talk about that, so, um, important questions to uh, so. I don't, I don't take Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Jackie Folsom. I'm the Legislative Director for the Vermont Farm Bureau. Um, we have in our policy that we wish all um, regulations regarding agriculture remain in the Agency of Agriculture. And that's what we've testified to consistently throughout. However, when the administration sent in language um, this last session to the House Ag Committee 
regarding changes in the wetlands ruling, we also um, supported those, as did uh, Secretary Anson Tevis and Secretary Julie Moore, in regards to the fact that we are looking for more clarity in the definitions. Uh, the fact that they are subjective as opposed to objective just seems to make this a, um, a challenge for everyone, not just agriculture, but we thought that that was a good beginning for a discussion, and we were supportive of that. Um, the other thing we were excited about was the fact that DEC um, offered up free uh, delineation services for farmers this summer, and talking with Marley Roop from uh, the agency, there were about a half dozen people that, that took um, took the opportunity to have that happen. I don't know what the uh, what the outcomes were, and certainly probably talking with Marley would be a good idea on that. But there was movement as regards to that offer and farmers taking advantage of that. Um, we, um, we are just in the beginnings of our Farm Bureau meetings, and I told Senator Starr that we would let our members know, which we did, um, if you have challenges with uh, wetlands issues or if you had successes with them. We'd like to hear from, from you. We've just finished four meetings, and we've got uh, eight more to go within the next two weeks, so uh, we'll be attending those to find out if we have any significant challenges or successes with our members. One person I was able to speak with was Brian Kemp, who was here at the last meeting, and I believe he's talked to Representative uh, Smith recently. Um, he is having challenges with culverts on his land, and it's, uh, the challenges are occurring through NRCS. Um, so he has delayed uh, any uh, contract negotiations with NRCS in regards to completing um, a, a change on one of the culverts that needs to be repaired because they are suggesting that he might need to put in a bridge as opposed to another culvert and the cost of that would be um, prohibitive. So he is he would love to have the opportunity to speak with the committee. I uh, believe that uh, there may be opportunity for him to talk with you at, a, at an Addison County meeting and I'd encourage you to reach out to him and make sure that he's on the agenda that day. And for the record, um, Vermont Farm Bureau was not part of the stakeholder group. We were not we were not asked to be on that group. That, that was through ANR. <coughs> so he has an NRCS problem, though. That's not that we have jurisdiction over. No, that's true. But you have been hearing that there have been challenges between NRCS and some of the, some of the other things that are going on. So it is a it is a challenge for the farmers. Well, I'm not questioning. That. Sure, I understand. Yeah, I, I don't know. It, it wasn't Brian that I talked with, but one farmer told me that it was $50,000 to change the culvert, but they were getting pushed to do a bridge that was two hundred and fifty dollars to $275,000. And he said, you know, a quarter of a million dollars it's just way out of reach uh, to, for a crossing. But, well, this is, uh, in Brian's case, it's, they are culverts. There are three culverts that have been pre-existing. And, and I believe his issue, obviously his issue is, you know, if we don't put the culverts in, the challenge to the, the land is going to be uh, intense because it'll, it'll, get, it'll get worse. Um, but he's had to stop doing anything with the situation because of the challenges. Uh, John? Sir Jackie. Our commission often you need permits from federal and state, and so in this NRCS case, would, would even if you worked out those challenges, would there be a DEC permit you would have to get? I am not clear on that. I think you'd have to talk to Brian. Yeah, we'll, he'll probably come to the uh, Addison County, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so there'll be opportunity. He did testify. At no, he was just here. He was here at the last, the last meeting. meeting. Yeah. But he's looking forward to speaking uh, with Chris. You. I'd be curious if you can help us as you're talking to members understand if if there's a predominance where these challenges show up, whether it's crop land or grazing or development or roads. You know, maybe it's the whole package, and we'll just have to accept that. But if it was coming up you know, uh, predominantly in roads, that would be helpful to understand, I think. So sure. If you're, if you're able to glean that, that would be really valuable. I'll be glad to make sure that we have that information. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator.
and Heather um, is going to be at the Franklin County meeting, I believe, uh, later on. Uh, the um, the 11 o'clock um, issue that we have on the schedule, um, have any of you any thoughts and ideas in regards to we have one more. What about this person? No, Pat. No, Pat. Pat oh, right. Right. He's at 10. Oh, um, you have a different agenda. I'm scheduled. I'm quite running. 1025, we have Pat. Brian. Is, is Pat here? Yes. Why don't we. Uh, we're catching up. Yeah, we're, we're doing well. Come on up, Pat. I've got a different agenda than I'm. It's okay. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Patrick O'Brien. I'm here on the Vermont Home Builders Association and uh, appreciate your time this morning. And I think what I'll do is I'll just, uh, 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 first of all, uh, for those of you um, who've never been through the process, uh, I'll try to enlighten you a little bit. But first, uh, I grew up, I was born and raised on a dairy farm. Um, uh, and then uh, pretty much all of my adult life, I've uh, been involved in the of the building and homes and buildings. Um, and I have, uh, I do recall when I was a younger man uh, meeting Dr. Bill Countryman, who I believe uh, met uh, uh, pretty much real to first wetland rules. Uh, and uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I've been involved with the rules and seeking permits uh, for many years, so I'm pretty familiar with it. Uh, certainly, if, if you want stories, uh, I'm the guy to talk to. But, anyways, um, just first of all, I'd like to say the process. Um, and the reason I want to explain the process is because um, while the application fee uh, to fill a wetland um, or a buffer zone is relatively small, and one of the challenging parts is, as previously mentioned, is the time it takes. So typically the way it, the way it happens is you know, you hire a consultant when you, when you do a project to delineate. Um, and that, he comes out or she comes out and they delineate the wetland and then uh, they or a, a second consultant or survey will come and pick up that survey and then they will make a map of it. Um, and then they will typically submit that to the state for clarification. And then usually after a number of weeks or a month, uh, the uh, a wetland biologist from the state will come out um, and check or verify the delineation. Um, and oftentimes, even if it's only a matter of a few feet, that delineation is adjusted. Um, uh, and, and typically you have your consultant there. Um, and, and then what happens is you, you bring the surveyor back out to, uh, to remap the wetland. Um, and then. I'm not sure. i not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Firm foundation. It missed you, Linda. <laughs> so that's all right. So, so once that second round of, of mapping is done, um, and if you're going to uh, be impacting or applying, um, you then have your consultant fill out the, the, the large application um, and send in the applicable fees. Uh, oftentimes, additional information is requested and your consultant sends it out. The, the point that I'm trying to make is that in the event, first of all, it would be great if there were no fees at all, but in the event through this process, if there's any suggestion that the fees be increased, I would, I would respectfully request uh, that there be pushback on that because as I first said, the, the fees are, if you read it, the fees are not astronomical because typically what you're proposing to fill is pretty small. 
But what gets very expensive and runs into the thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars are the consultant fees and the surveying fees that you have to pay in order to go through the process. So the, the actual fees in the application are very small. So that was the first point um, I, would, I, I wanted to make. Now, <clears throat> would it, wh why do we have to keep switching? Um, you get, you as a developer, you get your engineer, your consultant, uh, your delineator. Mm -hmm. Then, then you have to get the state delineator. Why couldn't these people be licensed to do the job correctly? And then, if they do mess up, they get a fine or lose their license or, or whatever. So we haven't got this give and take back and forth, uh, weeks and days and months. Uh, taken away. That, in fact, was part of one of our bills, was that there, uh, and it was at the uh, request of Julie Moore, that we begin the process of certifying or licensing, I forget the term, of uh, wetland scientists. So hopefully we're going to be moving towards something. Uh, Senator, I could not yeah. agree with you more. I think you, uh, you would find a large support from the Home Builders Association, not only for uh, the, the, the wetlands issue, but across the board for a lot of these, a uh, lot of these permits that are required from the from various agencies. Um, for the life of me, I, I have for years have wondered why we spend money at the state level and time uh, questioning uh, these professionals who have spent years and years and years and money getting their educations. Um, so, th th very good point to that. Um, in, in regards to um, uh, in regards to moving forward and, and trying to figure this out and making it so it's clearer, there are a few things that um, that I hope that that you all pay attention to. Um, and, and one of them, um, and, I, and I do believe there's movement on this issue, this issue um, from, from the wetlands office, and that is, as you may know, uh, storm, the stormwater permit, the stormwater division, uh, they have been working very hard, very, very hard uh, to administer their rules and come up with new rules, mostly as it relates to cleaning up our, our lakes and rivers. And um, in recent history, um, I had tried to uh, get a project approved wherein the, the storm water, after it had gone through its cleansing mechanisms, in other words, the four bays and the ponds, and then it discharges to a point, we had proposed that it discharge uh, into a wetland buffer, class two wetland, which ironically was simply uh, initially a dug pond used for irrigation, which is another whole subject. Um, but we weren't allowed to do that. We were not allowed to use a wetland buffer uh, for basically what would be high storm events, flood storage. I believe there is movement on that issue. Uh, and I believe that the, the wetlands division uh, is looking closely at that because they, I think, and I hope that they realize that uh, these buffer zones and maybe even sometimes these wetlands may have to sacrifice a little bit if we are actually going to do our best to clean up the lake. And, and this mostly, I think, what you'll find out is in retrofit situations where you have existing developments that are trying to comply with new with the new rules. So I just would like you to pay, pay attention to that. Um, Excuse me, was yours a retrofit situation? No, but ironically, it was in the state designated growth center. Okay. Um, so one of the things, and I don't know how this is all working. I know this is I know this is rulemaking. I don't know if at some point um, there's going to be some adjustment adjustment made to the statute. But uh, one of the things I would like you all to remember that I do believe that when it comes to our designated growth centers, that we should not be there shouldn't be automatic buffer zones around 
a classroom too well in a growth in a designated growth center. As you all know, we you all work very hard in coming up with a growth center statute, and there, unfortunately, uh, there were um, sacrifices uh, that had to be made uh, with our environment. You know, whether it be prime ag um, or, or, or any of these criteria that we have to address, and so I'm simply saying, in my little humble opinion. I believe that if we do want sprawl to stop or be reduced in development of these state designated growth centers, that buffer zones around class two weapons uh, should, um, should perhaps come into a different level, a, a lower level of scrutiny. Uh, but just keep, keep that one on your radar. Um, in regards to um, the, um, I'm, I'm going to struggle with a term here, but uh, historically, uh, the way that I was always taught was you have a wetland um, on your property if, if um, it consists of two of the three indicators. One of, and, and I may be wrong on this, but I'm fairly certain. One is, um, you know, the, 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 the plants. If you have wetland plants, that's an indicator. Um, if you have hydric soils, you know, if you have wet soils, that's an indicator. And also the soil composition. What is the soil made of is another indicator. And I was always taught that if you have two of the three, um, then you have a wetland. And that's how you create your delineation. Now, when you start adding into these um, presumable um, non-biological factors, for example, the Vermont Wetland Inventory Map, um, which on most occasions, because you have to remember, unless it was, in, unless the map was one, one, of, one of those that was uh, field verified, made its way through the system and, and was put on the map, that wetland is there because it was likely taken from a satellite position. Uh, and so on uh, most, of, most of the projects I've worked on is what we have found is that map is, is, is vaguely incorrect. And so what happens is you own the property um, and all of a sudden, because of this map, uh, it shows up that you have a wetland and all of a sudden you're in the wetland permitting process. <coughs> where that wetland may be not even on your property. It could be 100, 100 feet away. So it just makes me, from experience, uh, nervous to, to think that we would be uh, using a mapping system that's created by anything other than verified field work uh, to map wetlands. Um, Can I ask a quick question? Yes, please. So, if um, the it's kind of a chicken and egg problem, it seems a little bit, if you don't have uh, a mapping system that wasn't triggered by a development process, then how do you give people a heads up that, um, and, uh, and the mode of develop is always going to be based on trying to get some project done? So, there's an inherent tension between someone wants to get something. Done and say and sort of self-reporting. Maybe this is a weapon. I'm not asking for delineation. It seems like uh, an accurate mapping process would at least give everyone a heads up and clarity from the outset would save every time and frustration. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, and the key the key word is accurate, right? Um, and and, and uh, I can only imagine. Um, you know, we don't have the millions of dollars nor the, the, the staff in, in the wetlands division to create this yeah. accurate mapping. I don't know what the answer is. I'm just saying that the Vermont wetlands inventory map um, and non, that are non-verified wetlands should not, be, should not be used to determine whether something is a wetland or not. But in that same case, if we had our a delineator's license uh, 
when you hired your consultant as a private developer, you hired your consultant, uh, they, would, they would go and walk the property and, and, well, this could be a wetland, and they would do the delineation right then. That is correct. I mean, you haven't got a second guess uh, what the state may do. Uh, the, the long and the short of it, another example or an analogy is that um, if I were to look at a potential piece of property that was for sale, I have learned not to rely on the Vermont Wetland Inventory Map to see whether there is or is not a wetland because it's just not accurate enough. And the, I just don't even pay attention to it. There are other, there are other ways for me, because I know what a wetland is, I, I know what a wetland is um, most of the time because I've been around so long. And, you know, you just know. Um, but I think the 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 one of the issues that I'm always fearful of with our rules and our statutes is that uh, I'm from Chittenden County. Uh, thankfully, I'm uh, well educated um, and have a lot of experience. Um, and, and there are plenty of builders, um, or people of all sorts of industries, uh, who don't have the experience um, and may not may not know and don't know the rules. I'm not just not talking about wetlands. I'm talking about stormwater, archaeological, and everything. And I just don't know. I somehow the state um, could do better education. I just don't know how it's going to happen. Um, I know you guys, in, uh, you're on a, a time uh, crunch, um, so I just want to reiterate a few things. Um, the, you know, the buffer zone in, in the Gold Center, I'd like you guys to keep that on your radar. Um, the stormwater, I would like to applaud the agency if in fact what I have heard is true, that they are, they are working with the stormwater division. Um, we spoke about the, the inaccuracy of the Vermont Wetland Inventory Map. Um, the, uh, the, the, the last thing that I, I'd like to speak about is that um, you may recall several years ago when it comes to wastewater and water supply rules or, or septic systems, we now have what is called an overshadowing effect because what you, what you may remember is there were issues around the fact that when you want to site a septic system on, on your land, there's an isolation distance where you have to stay away, uh, for example, to drill a well. Um, so what the state did is they came up with a rule or a statute that said, you shall fill out a piece of paper and you shall send that to your neighbor who you are overshadowing. Your neighbor shall sign that piece of paper acknowledging they understand your overshadowing, and that shall become part of your wastewater water supply application. So you're notifying your neighbor that you are encumbering his or her land with this isolation distance. For example, if the neighbor in a year or so was planning on putting a well in that location, he or she can no longer. So they're acknowledging that through this notification process. I thought that was very, very well, well done. The same thing, unfortunately, happened to me recently on a piece of land that I own. I was fortunate enough because I know the business. I noticed the neighbor had was doing something, and so they had the, their wetland delineated. The wetland delineation went along my border on a piece of land that at some point in the next few years I was going to apply to build a house on. Uh, I, I had had my land delineated. There was no wetlands on my land. Uh, I don't, you don't delineate the neighbor's land. You just, it's illegal. Um, but, but thankfully, because I know the process, I went on the environmental notice bulletin I saw that the wetland had been delineated as a class two. All of a sudden, I knew what that meant. I automatically have a 50-foot buffer zone on my land. My land is immediately encumbered by that class two delineation. 
I only knew about it because I'm in the business. So moving forward, I would like to charge the agency to coming up with a similar mechanism uh, like we do with wastewater water supply so we, so we wouldn't unfortunately and automatically encumber the neighbor um, without notification. Certainly right now the neighbor gets notification if there's an application process, but unless the neighbor is astute with the rules and can correlate the fact that, oh, even though the wetlands on my neighbor's land doesn't show anything on my land, the application does not require that that buffer zone be drawn onto the neighbor's land. I think this is a huge, <coughs> a huge issue that needs needs to be brought to attention. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I will dispute with your neighbor. Uh, and he had a bunch of wetlands. Neighbor knew that'd be a good way to get. Uh, uh, absolutely. You know, fortunately, in this instance, because I was in the business, I caught it. Um, and I uh, subsequently working with the wetlands office, um, you know, figured everything out. I mean, I still have a buffer zone on my property that now I'm going to have to pay and go through all the process for, um, which is unfair. Um, but at least I know about it. At least I can budget for it and plan for it. Um, again, not fair. And that's one of the reasons why I bring it up. <coughs> that's, that. That should be a question that we would want to what? find out the answer, Chris. I, I, you've, you've uncovered a, a wrinkle in the public education that I hadn't understood, but what about that is unfair? I mean, other than the, it was by chance that you figured it out. Okay, so um, again, I'll use uh, analogy. Let's say that um, you owned a building lot that you were going to plan on building a house on. And, um, and let's say it was, didn't have any wetlands on it. Um, it's 100 by 100. It's 100 by 100 or 10 acres, whatever it may be, right? Do you think it's unfair that the buffer could cross property lines? Is that? I think it's unfair that the buffer can cross property lines without you being notified that it actually happened. Uh, unlike, so that, a, unlike the septic rule, you're not going to be able to repeal or push back yeah, the Yeah, no, no, I, I, this is why I'm trying to uncover it. You're, yeah. So it's not, you're not bothered that the, that the science of the buffer doesn't honor property lines. You're, you're talking about a process for notification, right? Correct. Okay, all right, Correct. that's what I want to do. Yes. Yeah. Uh, still, if you had that 100 by 100 law, and 50 feet of it was encumbered. Mm -hmm. So now you've got a 50 by 100 lot. How do you build on that? Well, well typically, well, I can only speak to my instance. Typically, and thankfully, my lot was upland. It was not wetland, right? Um, in a perfect world, if I had previous notification, I would have gone to the neighbor and said, if you want me to sign this piece of paper acknowledging it, then you're going to have to pay for my application fees. Yeah, because it's not cheap. No, it's not cheap. Not cheap. Um, so there's, you know, it deserves a lot more thought. In order to get permit to develop. Yeah. Uh, John. Oh, I was just going to ask. Uh, so this type of development uh, doesn't require uh, a notification to. Yes, I believe. I believe right now the way it would work. If this is what, how I. This will happen to me. I got when a wetland application is filed, um, the neighbor, the adjoiner, does get notification. And, and what the what the piece of paper basically says is, um, geez, by the way, your neighbor has applied. Uh, for a permit, please visit uh, www.environmentalnoticebulletin uh, to figure out what he's doing. Um, so fortunately, again, because I'm in the business, it was fairly easy exercise for me to determine that. But if I'm not in the business and I read this piece of paper, 
most of the time, I don't know what's going to happen. You're either going to throw in the trash and not pay attention to it, or you're going to go online and get frustrated, or you're going to, I don't know what you're going to do. Uh, or you're going to hire a consultant like that. <laughs> I mean, sure. Yeah. The, the thing is, the neighborhood would have no reason to hire a, a consultant if his law is all open. Right, exactly. Like I said, I had my land delineated and there was no wetlands. I mean, there were, let, me, let me back up. There were wetlands further down that I was not planning on impacting at all. Um, and that's why I had it delineated. I needed to know where those were. But on the other side of the property was where this overshadowing took effect. And all of a sudden, I have got to go through, pay all these fees in an application. Just, you know. So I think you guys could, and gals get the point. John? Yes? So something you said earlier, Patrick, reminds me of a question actually for Laura Hannah. Have you, has DEC or ANR thought what kind of army you would need to move something around experts and money to, to do a comprehensive um, sort of delineation of all the class two weapons in Vermont, you know, not from aerial mapping? experienced and wise enough to even ask that question, which 98% of the population is not. That's, that's the issue. Yeah. It would have to be procedural. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, any other questions? If, if not, uh, thank you. If you ever would like me to testify uh, on any of this stuff we have, you can uh, reach me through the Home Builders Association of Vermont. And are, one last question: Are you taking? Do you take? Are you taking written uh, testimony on this particular subject? Yes, and and that should go to Lender Lehman. Okay. And is there a deadline for such a thing? Well, our last meeting is December. Okay. Right. So in December, so it it should come prior to. Yeah, it should come during November. Okay. Because at the tail end, we've got to put our thoughts in, in an order and sure. draft up hopefully something to clarify and help out with this whole issue. So any time from now until, you know, the 20th of November uh, would be fine. Okay. Well, thank you all for the effort you put forth for our great state. Yeah, thank, thank you, Patrick. Um, for now, I've got the right. Um, so we're down to wetland rights at the federal, and, uh, and the issue is questions that we should develop to ask the federal Army court. And what do you? What are your thoughts in regards to that and why we plug that in here? Because 
we tried to get them to this meeting, uh, but uh, their supervisor was on the Yeah, the, the regional general came up. The, the general for the The, the general is yeah. in the town, and they had to go meet with the general, so. Um, we understand that. <laughs> yeah, that happens to us every time. <laughs> uh, so what, what are your thoughts on doing that at this time, or move on with our witnesses and do it at the tail end, or, or what do you think? Well, I think as uh, plenty of questions out there, what I was uh, wondering part of our, you know, uh, at 64 the English was clarified language on agriculture and uh, requiring uh, the agency of agriculture to revamp their RAPs. And so I'm looking at that piece and I'm thinking that NRCS uh, is the agency that we normally work with, but I know that uh, the Board is the one that has the delineation process and I'd like to maybe ask questions about the hope that we could, um, simply because uh, I know that if uh, NRCS comes out and delineates uh, some of our land, they, I believe they use the Army Corps uh, definition or uh, protocol or whatever you call it, their standard. So I think it's important that we understand both the agencies that are directly involved with agriculture. <clears throat> so, um, should we do that though at this time or move on with our witnesses and try to figure out what questions at the tail end of this meeting when there's just us around what we should ask? Well, I, would, I, would, I would prefer to have some more information about the Army Corps and their process so that it would help us formulate those yeah, questions because right now I mean I, I know I understand some of the ag issues but I don't know exactly how the Army Corps proceeds and what they do so I would like we, we did a Michael you did a nice uh, side by side with the state program and uh, NRCS uh, last time um, and I don't know how that correlates with the Army Corps, uh, but it would be nice to have some background information on the Army Corps before we start formulating our questions. Any other opinions? Uh, Chris? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Representative Smith. Um, you know, the understanding what, for instance, what projects uh, is what projects does Army Corps look at versus what the, uh, state, the states are looking at and sort out how often they're involved in assessment versus it's a purely state matter or it's a both uh, matter. Any no, I mean, I agree. I think we need the basics before we can develop the questions. And and so I'm ready to hear from the next witness to answer your question. Yeah, I, I think you know, it's kind of like a building deal that we stuck in there. But it's a little bit getting the car before the horse. So we'll, uh, if it's, uh, okay, we'll move on uh, to our um, advocates that are, that are here. Um, I, and uh, Bill Hoffman, um, you guys, are you, are you folks going to one at a time? Uh, Bill, that's okay Robin. with you. Yeah. Before I get started, I'll just <clears throat> pass around um, copies for each of you of three different documents um, that I also have a copy of for uh, the record that I'll give to Linda and uh, can also provide links to these. I'll refer to these in my testimony and then there are a couple of other bigger reports that I'll be referring to that I can also provide uh, links to.
All right, well, good morning, uh, Chair Starr, Vice Chair Sheldon, members of the committee. Thanks very much uh, for your time and the opportunity to testify this morning. Uh, for the record, my name is Phil Huffman. I'm the Director of Government Relations and Policy for the Nature Conservancy here in Vermont. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'll be testifying uh, in advance of a couple of other folks from the environmental and conservation community, John Grobman from uh, Vermont Natural Resources Council and David Mears from Audubon, Vermont. I'm going to try to concentrate my remarks, if it's okay with you, on sort of the Nature Conservancy's perspective on wetlands, uh, why we think they're important, how we've been involved in helping to conserve them, uh, and then uh, sharing what I think we think is some important recent evidence and new science um, about wetland uh, functions and uh, the values that they provide to our society here in Vermont uh, that you may not be aware of. Uh, and then at the end, I'll offer just some uh, quick thoughts uh, that tie into the policy process that you all are, are uh, digging into so, so deeply. Uh, and then I'll leave it to John and, and David to dig in more on the regulatory side of the program, uh, which is something that we're not sort of on the forefront of at the Nature Conservancy. Uh, and I don't have a written statement um, at this time, as I, um, but if it would be helpful, I can uh, sort of clean up my notes and get that to you after the fact. So, uh, okay, great, I'd be happy to do that. Um, so just by way of getting started, I think uh, you all have some feel for us, uh, the Nature Conservancy as an organization, but let me just touch on a couple of quick things that I think are relevant just as part of the backdrop for why we're interested in this issue and engaged in it here in Vermont. Um, as you may know, <clears throat> we're a global conservation organization, nonprofit that's dedicated to conserving the lands and waters on which all life depends. So that's human life as well as all the other species, uh, native biodiversity that we share the planet with. Um, one of our hallmarks, uh, certainly here in Vermont and everywhere where we work, uh, around the country and around the world, is that we're a science-based organization. So we rely on uh, the best science that we can gather either ourselves or in collaboration with others and drawing on science work that others are doing to inform our own conservation efforts and the work of others. So we try to make our science available to others uh, to help inform their work. Guided by that science, uh, we try to create innovative on the ground solutions uh, to some of the biggest challenges that we're facing here in Vermont and around the world so that nature and people can thrive together. So it's really about this intertwining of nature and people. We're not separate, we're all in this together. I don't think that's news to any of you, but just to be clear that that's where we're coming from. Uh, we work all around the country uh, and in all 50, uh, sorry, and in more than 70 countries around the world now. And here in Vermont, we're looking forward to celebrating our 60th anniversary next year. Uh, and as we do that, we're proud to be able to say that we've uh, had a hand in helping to conserve more than 300,000 acres of land uh, and 1,200 miles of shorelines uh, around the state. Uh, and to own and manage more than 55 uh, natural areas scattered uh, in, I think, probably every one of your districts as well as other parts of the state as well. As far as wetlands go, we see them sort of an overarching statement is that wetlands are a vastly underappreciated and I think probably uh, not well understood uh, natural system um, and resources um, that really have outsized importance both ecologically and for people uh, relative to their pretty limited scale and abundance on the landscape here in Vermont. Uh, and that's, we're trying to get the word out more, build people's understanding, obviously education and, and building understanding is a, a theme you've been hearing this morning. Uh, it's a key one from our perspective as well on all of this. Uh, we certainly uh, would affirm the broad range of values and functions that wetlands provide. You've heard about that from Laura earlier. Secretary Moore touched on it in her testimony at your last meeting. I won't take the time today to sort of walk through those, but just to say that we really see the whole breadth of the values and functions, both for nature and for people, that wetlands provide as being central to why they're so important. Uh, one thing that I did want to touch on that I think it may have been mentioned but not really highlighted, and I need to get back to you with more precision on, on this, but is 
that obviously climate change is a hugely important topic for all of us here and, and beyond. Uh, and wetlands, as part of their sort of outsized importance, um, have my understanding is from the science that there's they have sort of an outsized importance in their ability to, <laughs> to sequester and store carbon uh, relative to other natural systems. So it's something that I think most people don't think about. Oh, you know, wetlands maybe don't have a role in that. Actually, they do, and it's a maybe bigger than bigger than what you might otherwise expect role in that. Uh, so. As I sort of uh, wrap on that part of things, I want to just refer you to one of the things that I passed around, which is the, uh, it's a copy of a commentary from Digger, um, Vermont Digger, that uh, our, I'm sorry to say, former colleague Rose Paul uh, authored uh, several months back um, about its broad brush, sort of a popularized approach, but that simplifies some of uh, our perspective on uh, wetlands, um, their importance uh, for economic values, natural and recreational resources and whatnot. And I wrote, say Rose is our former colleague because she retired uh, at the end of August. So we're uh, feeling uh, her absence on our team for sure. Uh, because of their great importance, we at the Nature Conservancy have been involved in protecting and restoring wetlands uh, here in Vermont for decades, actually, and I just got information uh, a little bit ago. We tallied it up for this morning that our best estimate at this point is that we've been involved in protect, per, helping to permanently protect ourselves and with partners somewhere around 27,000 acres of wetlands uh, around the state. Uh, so those are wetlands that will be secured uh, from development uh, in the future without having to go through any permitting considerations or anything Does like that. Does that include uh, fish and game? Yes. Large trout, yeah. Federal parks as well? Absolutely. So those are include so both the properties that we continue to own ourselves and that we've done in cooperation with various state agencies, fish and wildlife, forests and parks, um, and with federal agencies as well. So that's an inclusive number. Uh, and within those of the ones that uh, we've had a hand in include some of the highest quality wetlands uh, around the state, and ones that some of you I know are familiar with, those of you may not be, but uh, those include the La Platte River Marsh in Shelburne, uh, so in the heart of Chittenden County, really special place. Uh, if you haven't been, we should go for a canoe trip sometime. Uh, Chickering Bog in East Montpelier, not far from here. Happy to go for a walk there with anyone who wants to. Uh, the Dennis Pond wetlands up in Brunswick, uh, up in the Northeast Kingdom, part of the former Champion Lands uh, there. And then uh, ongoing efforts that we're in, in really involved in, um, in helping to conserve and restore the Otter Creek Swamps Complex, which is actually in Representative Smith, Senator Bray's, Representative Sheldon's uh, districts. Am I leaving anybody out? But uh, uh, so, <laughs> but, well, and it's, you know, I think we all have some awareness about Otter Creek Swamps, may not know that it's actually the largest wetland complex, uh, freshwater wetlands complex in all of New England. So really, really special place um, in a broader regional context. Uh, and our work there is a great example of collaboration uh, with both <coughs> state agencies and federal agencies. We have a very robust partnership, um, among others, with the uh, Fish and Wildlife Department um, to try to uh, advanced conservation there. And I want to emphasize, too, that our work in all of this conservation and restoration efforts on wetlands, as is true of all of our work, is with willing landowners. So this is not about telling people what to do. It's about trying to work with people to find solutions uh, to the situations that they have. I want to add a couple of other concepts uh, that we think relate to and hopefully reinforce the, the value of wetlands, why we see them as important. We think about them in part as a form of natural capital. Uh, that's a phrase that some of you may have heard, maybe not, um, which are a reference to living systems that we people depend on for survival. Uh, they're sort of like money in the bank that we can live off of the interest, but we get into trouble when we dip into the principal. So that's a sort of a guiding thought for us in terms of wetlands here in Vermont. We need to protect what we have, try to restore what we've lost. And contrary to probably many people's perceptions, I think we think about wetlands as one form of working lands. We, we know that ag lands, forest lands, obviously critical working lands for Vermont, Vermonters for a whole bunch of different reasons. Wetlands are working lands too. They work for us in some different ways in providing, and this goes back to the functions and values that Laura shared before, um, things like flood storage, 
reducing the vulnerability of downstream communities, as was the case for Middlebury with it being downstream of Otter Creek swamps and uh, when Tropical Storm Irene rolled through, uh, and helping to address our water quality problems. I'll speak more to that uh, before. But again, just this notion of wetlands as part of our rich suite and mosaic of working lands in the state that provide a whole host of benefits uh, for people as well as for nature. Um, and then we also think about wetland protection and restoration as a primary form of what we at the Nature Conservancy, and, and this isn't only to us, I think, but refer to as nature-based solutions. So this is using nature to help address some of the big societal challenges that we have, like water quality, like uh, flood vulnerability, uh, and like tackling climate change. So again, nature-based solutions, the role that in this case wetlands can play in, help us, in helping us to address those sorts of challenges. And the evidence that we have from TNC from uh, broadly, and it's uh, out there uh, from other organizations as well, is that nature-based solutions can actually often be significantly uh, cheaper <coughs> um, than more traditional engineered or sort of gray infrastructure types of approaches to the kinds of challenges that I was touching on. So now I want to shift and just touch on uh, some of the recent evidence and science that I think ties into this that helps to uh, make the case for why wetlands are, are really important and why it's, it's so critical that you all are going through a very thoughtful process before uh, making any sorts of changes to the statute and regulations. Um, so first, the, the monetary value of wetlands um, was highlighted in a report that was released about a year ago uh, by the Trust for Public Land that they did for us if, here in Vermont uh, in collaboration with the rest of the Vermont Forest Partnership that many of you are familiar with. The Nature Conservancy is one of the members of the Forest Partnership. And so the report looks like this. It's a big report. I'll get you a link uh, to it. But this is the Vermont's return on investment in land conservation. So it's not specific to wetlands. It's about the, the ROI um, that the state has gotten from investments in land conservation from only the natural goods and services that have been pr provided from those conserved lands. So things like water quality protection or improvement, reduced flood vulnerability, uh, food production, things like that. Wetlands were one of a whole host of land cover types that were considered in this study done by the Trust for Public Lands National Conservation Economics <clears throat> Team. Mixed forest, deciduous or mixed forest, uh, grasslands, things like that. So, and the estimate was, and you know, so these are estimates, take them with a, you know, a little bit of a grain of salt, but it was about $590 an acre um, was the value of wetlands for the natural goods and services they provide in the form particularly of flood protection and habitat. Um, then you can also layer in things like carbon storage, water quality and whatnot, the value would go up from there. Uh, and then uh, I want to shift and uh, focus for a few minutes on some recent research uh, that was just uh, published by the Gund Institute at UVM um, back in the springtime. And this, uh, I think it was the second handout that I passed around, uh, has a one pager that looks like this. It's a, actually a press release online, but uh, that we released jointly with, uh, with Gund. Uh, so this is uh, the snapshot of work, collaborative partnership research that we have uh, commissioned with Gund over the last couple of years, looking at trying to quantify the value that nature-based solutions, wetland protection and restoration particularly, and floodplain restoration, uh, can provide in addressing water quality and, uh, and flood protection. Uh, so this report, again, pretty hot off the presses, was there's a, a published journal article uh, that, again, I'll provide you a link to. It's, uh, I have a copy, but it's several pages long and pretty dense scientific stuff. Um, but the, uh, the gist of that is that the, the work that the folks at Gunn did uh, indicate that Vermont could meet about 15% of its phosphorus reduction goals for the Lake Champlain TMDL. <laughs> So 15% of what we're required to do under the TMDL through wetland restoration. So it could be up to that much. Uh, and that's through restoring 
wetlands that have been degraded over the course of decades uh, from various sorts of activities. There are more than 3,600, I think the total was, of wetlands uh, that were considered by the gun folks. So it's a vast array, and obviously restoring all of those would be a huge undertaking. But we think it, uh, it really helps to illustrate the way in which restored wetlands can, again, help to address, address one of the key societal challenges that we have. Uh, a couple of other things about this work that I want to just highlight. Um, one is that uh, the gun researchers found that from the modeling work that they did, that it appears that small wetlands um, have an outsized importance, actually, and that restoring smaller wetlands that are close to stream networks uh, can offer the greatest nutrient reduction relative to cost. So I think as we think about the potential for changing size thresholds on what is or isn't considered a jurisdictional wetland and whatnot, evidence from gun, among other things, I'll come to another, another bit of evidence in a minute, suggests that small wetlands have a particularly important role to play. Uh, and then uh, there also was some uh, sort of more smaller scale research that the gun folks did. This is kind of preliminary, but in the Missisquoi Basin. So the, the overall body and conclusions that I was referring to refer to the Lake Champlain Basin as a whole. They did a bit more zeroed in research on the Missisquoi Basin. And it, preliminary indications are that there, uh, the estimates of phosphorus reduction may be quite a bit higher than the 15% uh, that I had mentioned before. So more to come on that. And so we're continuing to collaborate with them. Gund is working on this research more to try to get a clearer sense of exactly what the phosphorus reduction benefit can be from restoring particular wetlands. They were looking at it sort of broad brush as a whole suite of wetlands, but zeroing in on, on more uh, site-specific wetlands to get at the benefits that can be provided. The one other piece of science that I wanted to, to mention um, is another published journal article. It's even more dense than the gun one, um, but I'll provide you with a link to it too if you want to dig into it. Um, it was published a couple of years ago, and it really reinforces this point about uh, the <clears throat> value of smaller wetlands. Um, and this was not a Vermont-specific study, but it gets at the same, the same general idea um, that uh, small wetlands account for a disproportionately large fraction of the overall nutrient removal potential um, if you're looking at wetlands of different sizes. What size is small? Yeah, I, I thought you might ask that question. So I think in that one, it, Under a half acre yeah. Or a so in that one, um, I, I want to double check on this, but I think they went down to as small as about uh, 10 meters square. So. 100 square meters altogether, and then they kind of they had different size gradations up from there. So it's pretty pretty small. Yeah. Yeah. So why are they disproportionately beneficial? That's a good question, uh, and I'll need to look into that more. I was sort of looking at the top line conclusions that they that they offered um, in their you know the sort of summary of the analysis. Uh, so, I think that's a very good question. So we'll, we'll follow up with that. Yeah. Yeah. Chris. Yes. And along those lines, does that then, the proposal in front of us is to shift to a size based delineation and let people go crazy if it's small. So, does that concern you then, given what you just no. said? It's under, it's not about crazy. Well, if it's small, we're not considering it a wetland. That's the whole premise, right? No, um, there's, there's like seven different criteria that have been outlined, and um, we, we have the half acre, then what's connected to streams, and um, we have hillside with seeps, um, which I think there's a size threshold for that, and then burn pools of any size, wetland. So what if it's under actual communities of any size would be protected? What was with uh, individual species and would be protected? But the first test is a size test, right? It's they're they're all looked at together. If you meet one of the seven, it's protected. So my question stands: Do you worry about the size if? 
you're saying, the science is saying, the size is sort of not a fair, not uh, relative to the value. Should we, are we unwise to consider size as a criteria? I think it's something to think very carefully and proceed cautiously about, which is what I would urge on this whole dialogue, and I appreciate the thoughtfulness that you all are bringing to this, along with the others who are helping to inform the discussion. I, I think a, a straight size-based threshold on its own, um, particularly one that goes towards smaller wetlands would be, uh, that, that would leave out smaller wetlands would be of concern. Um, I think if there's uh, a way of layering some of layering in some other considerations uh, along with size that could be helpful uh, in addressing that. And and I will come back. You know, from our perspective, we do feel like the functions and values uh, consideration is very uh, appropriate. I think just given the nature of wetlands, their complexity, uh, and all of that, we appreciate in saying that the challenge around subjectivity, objectivity, speed of determination. So I want to be clear, like we we want to work together to, with everyone who cares about this to be a part of the conversation of what an appropriate solution is. Can I just have a Chris? Could, could I just have a follow up? Oh, sure. Go ahead. When you talk about the, the value of restoring wetlands, I sort of think of our best approach is to just leave wetlands alone in a sense, but but what does it mean to restore them? Is that usually removing a built object, or, or can you just paint a little bit of a picture for me? Sure. I, I think it depends, as is true with a lot of this conversation. Uh, but uh, I suppose at one end of the spectrum could be something like the removal of structures, but that would be a more, much bigger undertaking um, and uh, you know, more costly, more just a bigger endeavor. Um, <clears throat> there are opportunities, I think, that are um, on a different point on the spectrum to restore wetlands that uh, have been changed to a different use in agriculture, for instance, um, and where uh, they may not be serving uh, as much of a useful purpose now with the changes in our climate, with the increased precipitation, the increased flooding that the chair was referring to before. Uh, so lands, wetlands, former wetlands that have become farmland that are now more marginal, less productive than they may have been at the time that they were converted. Opportunities there and where it's in the absence of things like structures, it's much more straightforward to try to uh, restore something resembling a more natural uh, wetland situation. So, yeah. I, I want to be clear in saying this though, we're, we're not proposing to uh, um, bring back the 30, what did I say, 3,600 plus wetlands uh, that we're aware of at least that are that have been transitioned to other uses including agriculture. We realized like, that would be a huge undertaking um, and that there are all sorts of different considerations in that. But I think that what, what this all points to is just the, in general, is looking at the value of wetland restoration to help address some of the big challenges we're facing and to try to be really smart and well informed with science and strategic um, as we're making investments to try to move in that direction. When, when you're talking about 30 million acres, it's not just in Vermont. Did I say 30 million? I thought that's what you said. Oh, it, 30, yeah. It, if, if I said 30 million, that was a, that was a mistake. <laughs> so I think the 30-ish the figures that I've used, so our land conservation that we've been a part of for the Nature Conservancy overall is about 300,000 acres yeah. in Vermont. And then the, there are about upwards of 3,600 wetlands in uh, the Champlain Basin. So that's just the Champlain Basin, not Vermont as a whole, that have been identified as having been altered from their original state. Um, and this is not new data that we've developed or the gun did. They're using existing data. And I think it, it ties into the statistic that Secretary Moore shared in her testimony last time and that maybe someone alluded to earlier this morning about the 35% loss of wetlands from original, you know, sort of original historic conditions a couple of centuries ago. Uh, you guys in Addison County get a little nervous, are you? No, not nervous. <laughs> Oh, wet ones down there. You got it. Go ahead, Chris. 
So, right, I was going to ask for a clarification of things, sure. and I think you just said. So, the 35% loss represents loss of wetlands statewide over a sort of early conditions, hundreds of years back. That's the baseline. That's my understanding. I would defer to the experts uh, with uh, the, the department, the agency, um, or others, but that's my understanding. Okay. Well, I know that last time we talked about it, and it's something for us to chase down, Senator Smith was bringing up earlier, that if the inventory excludes <coughs> converted farmland, then it may be understated the total conversion. So, something in order to figure out. The, and then in terms of the TMDL addressing 15% of it, reading it uh, through um, what work, do you know if, if the 15% that just involves rent farm, sorry, wetland restoration, um, you have farmland, non-farmland, both of them lumped together? So where yeah, those it, sites are? Yeah, I haven't been on the front lines of the partnership with GUN, so I would defer to my colleagues who have been closer to it, and we can get back to you with an affirmation or be happy to have one of my colleagues or potentially with someone from GUN come to testify about this in the future. But I believe it's about the more complete universe, so it's not necessarily just ag-impacted um, wetlands. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, my question was almost the same, but I'd, I'd like a little more clarification. You said 15% of the phosphorus uh, TMDL could be met um, with wetland restoration. So I'm thinking that that would be not the wetlands that we've already restored, but ones that we could restore in order to meet that 15%. And that gets back to one of my earlier questions. Where are these wetlands? What watersheds are in? And, you know, where they are. And I, I also, uh, when you mentioned that uh, you know, with the increased rain events that we're having, you know, there's becoming some more marginal ag land um, that's out there, and I'm very concerned about Addison County. Uh, we've heard testimony that there's three characteristics that make up uh, a wetland or to define a wetland. And uh, I know that a lot of uh, the lands that we have are on hybrid soils. And uh, I also know that we've had an incredible amount of rain this year, and a lot of crops are going to get planted, and a lot of crops right now are going to be struggling to get harvested uh, because of that additional water. And I, I'm just wondering how, you know, we, we, we deal with that, we recognize that, because that's going to have a tremendous economic impact on, you know, the agriculture, not just in Addison County, but in the state. So, yeah, I'm just trying to understand how we do that. And I applaud you for the work that you've done. I've seen quite a few of the restoration projects, and you know they're good projects. Uh, you know, uh, the farm families that were involved were all in agreement that yes, this might be a good thing for them to do. So, you know, there's some trade-offs. Yeah. <laughs> so I appreciate everything that you're saying, and I think you know it's complicated. I think that from our perspective. Um, this new science from Gund um, reinforces our sense of the opportunity that wetland restoration does offer to deal with water quality, deal with flood resilience, and deal with some other societal challenges, absorbing more carbon, things like that, uh, and providing better habitat for native species. Uh, and uh, we recognize, we're very, um, sensitive to and sympathetic to, I would say, as an organization, the challenges that the agricultural community is facing in Vermont right now. I want to be really clear about that. Uh, so, and we see working in the kinds of ways you were just alluding to in collaboration with landowners to, to find a solution uh, that can meet their needs, yeah. provide some uh, financial compensation potentially to help deal with the squeeze that they're dealing with for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, and to get to beneficial outcomes, um, sort of mutually desirable outcomes, um, is is very possible. Is it's not the silver bullet uh, as far as getting to solving the water quality challenges or meeting the TMDL. It's you know up to 15 percent, or maybe it's a bit more than that, depending upon some further research to be done. 
Um, but it's an, it's an important component and one that we see can be very cost effective both in the short term and then also in the long term, I think as Laura alluded to before with wetland restoration uh, or with wetlands, natural systems, you, they don't require maintenance unlike human constructed uh, solutions. And so if we do it right at the beginning, we can let nature do its thing and provide these benefits over the course of a long time. Now, we haven't had VHCB in the Vermont Land Trust, but I would think um, when they purchase the development rights on family, which has been a tremendous amount, that those wetlands in those properties that they have bought the development rights, I should think those would have been set aside to be conserved. You know you can't develop or farm in a wetland, really. Wouldn't, wouldn't they have been set aside to be preserved? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ultimately, I would defer to VHCB and VLT to give you a definitive answer um, as the ones who've been on the front lines of that work more than we have. Um, but I guess I would say that I think, again, it probably depends, as frustrating an answer as that is, um, that I think you know some of the easements and whatnot that they did were from several decades ago when there was much less of an understanding about all of this. And so the provisions in those easements relative to these issues may be different and may be more um, flexible than may be the case uh, more recently. I think that, that at least in more recent uh, easements, it would tend to be providing for protection of existing wetlands, but not necessarily restoration of any wetlands on the property that may have been altered for whatever purposes in the past. We'll, we'll try to get them to come in. John? Yeah. So I had a question about birds. Um, yeah. And science-based explanations, too. So sure. uh, look at Laura's sheet here. Again, a great question. I appreciate your asking it. Ultimately, again, I would defer to others who are more bird experts than I am. Um, and David Mears is, I don't know if he's here yet, he will be soon. He's now, as you know, the head of Audubon Vermont, so he could maybe speak to this. Uh, they have some new information that I think ties right into this uh, beyond this, this uh, national uh, information. But uh, <clears throat> I might. My uh, hunch is that uh, the decline in bird populations um, is maybe probably partly tied to what's been happening with wetlands across the country um, or across North America. Um, and then, you know, Vermont's a small part of that much bigger picture, um, and that there are a bunch of other factors contributing. But I think, you know, the I don't have the statistics on the top of my head, but nationally we've been going backwards on wetlands. Uh, in a significant way, um, and so I'm sure that that uh, is not having a positive influence on the trends that are going on with bird populations. So is Vermont seen as, you know, a leader in wetland protection and restoration compared to other states? Yeah, that, that's a very good question, and I don't feel like I'm really well uh, qualified or positioned to, to answer that in any kind of well-informed way, so I, I defer to others. Yeah. <coughs> Can I, I, can I wrap up really quickly? Yeah, yeah. Sure. thank you. I appreciate all the time and, and all the uh, really important questions that you're asking. So, so just to uh, close by transitioning a little more into the, the policy context, um, I wanted to refer to the third document that I passed around, which is a one-page, uh, two-sides uh, document titled Principles for Protection and Restoration of Wetlands. Uh, so this is a, a document that we at the Nature Conservancy have been involved in developing over the last few months in collaboration with several of our uh, environmental and conservation uh, 
allies and partners. Um, the, the list of the organizations is on the back page, uh, so it includes VNRC and Audubon Vermont as well as others. Uh, and I won't take the time to walk through this uh, in any uh, detail now, but I would really uh, encourage you to look at it carefully. It's pretty high level, uh, but there's some important principles in here about the importance of wetlands, reinforcing some of what I and others have talked about, some of the threats to wetlands uh, that you're, I think, aware of, have heard about, um, but then getting at some important points in sections three and four uh, about how fundamentally, from our perspective, we feel it's really critical for this process and any consideration of adjustments to Vermont's regulatory framework for wetlands to be as well informed by science as possible. Um, and I think particularly in light of what's happening at the federal level where that is not the case, at least right now, uh, to anywhere near the degree that it has been in the past, grounding ourselves in science here in Vermont is absolutely essential. Uh, we also, um, among other things, would recommend the, the established policy here in Vermont and in many other places and nationally, I think probably still, although I would question it, is no net loss of weapons. We feel like that actually is inadequate um, and that we should be shifting to a net gain policy. Um, and the way to do that is to protect what we have and to restore some of what we've lost. And again, the rationale for the restoration is for the whole host of benefits that uh, wetlands provide for us in water quality, flood protection, <coughs> things like that, as well as for the ecological values that they provide. And then a third point, um, and this has been touched on a bunch today, but is uh, from our perspective at TNC and with our colleagues, uh, and you'll hear more about this, I think, uh, that we don't think it's appropriate to rely on federal laws and regulations to provide the protection uh, and sound guiding framework for wetlands here in Vermont that we need. Uh, <clears throat> the state regulations and statute do and need to continue to provide uh, an effective framework to fill important gaps relative to what's there at the federal level. And then beyond that, as has been alluded to, the federal laws are in flux. The current administration has actually gone forward with a significant shift in the definition of, quote, waters of the United States, which reduced the jurisdiction that the Corps and EPA have over wetlands in the U.S. It's been a big, big deal over the last couple of years. Um, that is now taking effect, and so I think it's really important that we provide a very solid ground here in Vermont to make sure that we're not uh, following suit. And then also just there's a practicality as, as uh, overwhelmingly challenging as I think it must be for our colleagues at DEC to administer all of this with six folks. The Corps of Engineers is an even more challenging situation. There are two core staff for the entire state of Vermont. Um, and I'm not even sure if they may have some responsibilities outside of Vermont. So I think we should be very careful about how much we're relying on the feds to do the job of protecting these irreplaceable yeah. resources. Uh, so I'm going to uh, wind it down there. Um, and uh, you know, I just want to reiterate, we, we share the goals that I think you all have and everyone in this room has about trying to get to greater, greater clarity and predictability um, and, and just understandability, if that's the word, um, around all of this for folks that are in the regulated community and, and just more generally. Um, and that as we work towards doing that, we need to be careful not to go backwards um, and really try to, again, be guided by science in helping to figure out what the best possible solutions are and to, and to really figure out the best way to address some of these complicated, intertwined uh, issues and, and situations. So thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, questions uh, for Bill? Uh, one question that I have. Uh, we, we did uh, receive a report uh, uh, from our council in uh, what other states are doing. Mm -hmm. And in that uh, report, uh, I guess my question to you, being a national, part of a national organization, those states that that rely 100% on the Army Corps uh, to do their regulating, um, what are you folks doing in those states to uh, help uh, with our wetlands problems that we have nationwide? Um, so I was just wondering if you had any explanation of you know, why 
in one of the smallest states in Vermont, we've done, I think, pretty well. And yet, what's happening in these other states where there's no state regulation? Yeah, really good question. Uh, um, I don't know offhand, um, and I can look into it more with colleagues from the Nature Conservancy who are working in other states around the country uh, to try to get a sense of what their experience has been, and particularly those kinds of situations. Uh, I think it, it is an interesting one. Um, and I guess, you know, it's um, probably a result of a lot of different factors, whether it's politics, state budgets, um, philosophical but approaches, you could look that sort of thing. That. So I'll try to get you some more information yeah, thank on that. You. I guess we're all set. Thank, all right, thank you for your time. Thanks, Bill. Welcome. Thank you all very much. Uh, John? Mr. Chair? Yes. We're training this evening. You know, I, I'm, I know everyone in the pretty well from years before. And good intentions all the way up and down the table. And I'm a little troubled that so many of the ways we're looking at natural resources, just from a utilitarian point of view, like what services they deliver as opposed to preserving uh, some of these natural places in their natural state because of their inherent value. And I hope we don't always keep sort of holding ourselves to the thing. You know, there's a dollar, if we can't attach a dollar value to we're, we're less inclined to um, hold on to those spaces. So, I'm just, it seems as though pretty often in policy work, we end up getting dragged into, we need to assign a dollar value. And if we can't, then it's a little harder to say um, we're going to value that resource, even if we can't put a price tag. I think we're, we're doing uh, that to some degree. I think Bill just in his testimony says $567 of value to, uh, per acre of wetlands in for society and you know, good down there. So, you know, I think, I mean, we're hearing good testimony. Sure, I'm not challenging the quality of the testimony anyway. I just don't want to stop the direction uh, thank you. Any, go ahead, John. Welcome. Um, thank you, thank you for that opportunity to testify today. For the record, my name is John Grove, and I'm the Policy and Water Program Director for Vermont Natural Resources Council. I apologize, I'm not on top of my game entirely. And, you folks probably aren't either, as we're been meeting for hours and it's pretty close to lunch. But it's also it happens to be Yom Kippur today, and so it's the, the day of fasting for the um, Jewish holiday. So I am fasting today. I didn't have any coffee today, or so if I'm a little short, I'm cranky. Um, I hope you'll forgive me. But I, I do on a serious note. It's not your fault, but I think all over Vermont, like the legislative committees and such, should just be cognizant of these holidays, and it was, I'm here because it's so important. This is a really important opportunity I didn't want to miss, but um, I am probably not at the tippy top of my game. But. So with that, um, so I'm gonna focus uh, on sort of the nuts and bolts issue, as I really appreciate it. Phil's testimony, we try to organize our testimony to try to hit different aspects of this. So I'm gonna talk about a little bit about um, the no net loss of wetlands policy in a little bit more depth. You heard a little bit of that from Phil. I'm mostly going to talk about uh, a brief history of wetland regulation in Vermont to give you more context, and I won't repeat what you've heard from others, um, but I, I will emphasize some other points. Um, I'll comment on the changes to the wetland laws and rules that have been proposed by ANR and the Agency of Agriculture, Food, and Markets, and I will close by I do want to address at the last meeting there was a discussion about the language that was added to H525 in the conference committee and different interpretations of that language. And I want to give you my views on that language. And um, I don't because I don't know where that stands right now. And I want to go on record with uh, our view on that language. So uh, as context, 
So my experience in wetlands in Vermont, this is, I just want, I think it's helpful uh, uh, to understand where I'm coming from on this. I've been working on wetlands issues in Vermont since 1995. First as an a attorney where I provided advice to a &R about wetland uh, issues and I defended a &R permit decisions on wetlands in front of what was then the Water Resources Board. I was the executive director of the Water Resources Board uh, for two years before the board was eliminated in the permit reform of 2004, and at that point the board uh, administered the wetland rules, adopted the wetland rules, uh, processed, uh, uh, heard the appeals of decisions, of uh, wetland decisions from ANR, <laughs> heard reclassification petition decisions. So the point of, is I've seen this from a lot of different angles, and I think that makes me uh, you know, have a perspective that hopefully could help you in, in the work that you're trying to do now. In addition to that, uh, as part of my work at BNRC, on two different occasions, I participated in two separate efforts to look at changing the wetland laws in Vermont. One in 2007 that <coughs> culminated in 2009 in changes to the wetland laws in Act 31 of 2009. Um, and those were the jurisdictional changes that Laura alluded to, and I'll talk a little bit about those more when I get to sort of the nuts and bolts of this. And then the process that you've heard about today that I think began, I think it began, I don't actually don't remember exactly when it began. Uh, it was right before um, the uh, Scott administration came in, into office. And in my view, it's going on today. That has not been completed because the result of that was ideas that have been presented to the legislature and to this committee now for changing the wetland laws. So I view that as an incomplete effort. Uh, that, but I was involved with that as well. Um, so I, I just I agree with everything that Phil talked about in terms of the ecological importance of wetlands and uh, what others have said. Um, I, I think it's important on this no net loss of wetlands concept um, to kind of take us back to you know our wetland rules went into effect in 1990. What was happening in 1990? What was happening in the late 80s was there was a recognition. Um, that we had lost a significant amount of wetlands all over the country, including in Vermont. And it was actually George H.W. Bush and uh, his EPA in the late 80s that came up with the no net loss of wetlands policy. And that permeated uh, through the states and um, that became the federal policy in the late 80s and it became the Vermont policy in 1990. And as Phil noted, that's codified in the Vermont wetland rules to this day. Um, so we've seen a sea change in how we've looked at wetlands from sort of the pre, mid, uh, going up to the late 80s where wetlands were viewed as swamps and, and, and things to be filled and uh, to, to be contended with versus the vital natural resources that we know they are today. So since that change in policy nationally and in Vermont, we have made progress in slowing the destruction of wetlands, but by no means are we ahead in terms of wetland protection. We still are way behind in terms of the amount of wetland loss we've seen as a country and a state up until now. And one of our concerns about the proposals that have been made by a and and the Agency of Agriculture is that um, they will result in less oversight over wetlands and they will result over uh, in um, more wetland loss. Um, you know, I think I just think I don't think there's any doubt about that, and I'll go into a little bit more about why in a second. But it seems like we don't want to go in the wrong direction. We have, and the and the and the law of the land in Vermont is still no net loss of wetlands, and we just don't see proposals to uh, lessen the review of wetlands in Vermont as consistent with that policy. John, uh, before you go on, yep. Uh, how do you know where we are with net loss, net gains, neutral? Um, do you have do you have facts and figures? Well, I know I know that the proposal from A and R is to look at less to regulate less wetlands. So if you're going to regulate less wetlands, because I think this gets to Senator Pearson's question, um, it's true that there are a number of different thresholds that a is proposing to replace the function and value threshold for jurisdiction now, but those thresholds all result in not reviewing certain wetlands, certainly smaller wetlands. 
Um, wetlands under a half an acre, wetlands under a certain size threshold that are adjacent to waters or impaired waters. There are some other qualifiers in there, but they're not as comprehensive of as the jurisdiction we have today. So I would challenge anyone to say that the changes proposed is going to, not going to re re result in less jurisdiction and oversight. So therefore, we're going to protect less wetlands because we're going to be looking at less wetlands and their impact. That's so you the basis think of the only opinion. way wetlands are preserved <clears throat> is by a stick, not by a carrot? I think that if you do not uh, have oversight over wetland impacts, yes, people will impact wetlands because legally they'll be able to do so, and they won't have to get permits. People aren't, I don't believe that people on their own will just avoid and minimize impacts to wetlands without a regulation. Uh, I think that's why in the 80s we shifted our policy is a known at loss of wetlands policy and stronger reg regulation on the state and federal level. And I'll talk a little bit about the federal system is not uh, sufficient, as Phil alluded to at the end of his testimony, in my opinion. But yes, I don't think there's That's any better. That's all your opinion. I, I, I think no. it's, uh, it's, it's logic to say that if you're going to have jurisdiction and be, if, if they're uh, under the law, people will be allowed to impact wetlands they will impact more wetlands. So you can take that as my opinion, you can take it to be whatever what you want it to be. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the changes that were made in uh, 2009 that the proposal from a from and r would undo, basically. Those changes were as a result of a two-year intensive process in which the environmental, environmental groups uh, and business groups in particular work to address this issue of that jurisdiction over wetlands in Vermont was primarily based on wetland maps, which you heard a little bit about. But it's important to know that it's not just the maps. Under the law since 1990, any wetland contiguous to a wetland on the map was jurisdictional. So there's already it was been in the law from the beginning that not just wetlands on the maps would trigger jurisdiction that people were on notice that uh, if they impacted a wetland that was contiguous to a map wetland, uh, those wetlands were jurisdictional and you needed to get a permit. Um, but we all recognized in 2007, going up to 2009, that the maps were not sufficient. There had always been this process where you could petition to uh, designate a wetland as jurisdictional that wasn't on the map, or perhaps wasn't contiguous to a wetland on the map, but it was a very cumbersome process before the Water Resources Board, which involved something that felt very much like a, like, a, like a hearing and a contested case proceeding. And so what we did in 2009 is we said, we're going to allow A&R, basically, in the field to go out and review whether wetlands are significant and have, are significant for one of the functions and values listed in the wetland rules, and then more quickly, issue a piece of paper to the landowner and say this wetland is significant and you could, the landowner could challenge that decision, um, but if the challenge wasn't made, that wetland could be designated by a &R, uh, as a wetland and we would increase the wetlands that we were protecting in the state of Vermont. Um, I think that that's a good process and this is what I mean, that we're, if we go with a &R's proposal, we would undo that by saying, no longer would there be a function, functions and values review. You're going to, based on these factors such as size and your proximity to a water body or impaired water or certain sort of natural communities that are in a wetland, and you're going to basically lose that functional analysis that we agreed on in 2009 to basically get at wetlands and their functionality regardless of size. And, um, that is our, our core objection to what the agency is proposing. Uh, we're open to ways to work to create clarity and more efficiency, and I think there are ways to do that, uh, but they're not reflected in what the agency is, has, has proposed. Um, so I, I just, and it's frustrating to me, having been part of that process, I spent two years working with the business community, and I testified about this in Representative Partridge's committee in the session, and the farmers were not part of that effort because the focus wasn't on farming. The focus really was on development and developers 
and their issues with the wetlands system. And that doesn't mean that there aren't issues with farming and wetlands that should be addressed and this committee should look at. But that was just not the overarching view. And so the proposal that's been made to this committee and that was made during the session to both the Senate Ag Committee and the House Ag Committee really was not about farming. Really what I'm talking about now is not about farming. It was basically undoing what we did in 2009 to affect all other development it was a major, major discussion in regards to agriculture. Right, but not that particular issue. Not what, not this part of it. It has nothing not to do with farming. Draft. What A and R put forward did have provisions in there related to farms, but that's not what these provisions really are, are aimed at getting at. These provisions are aimed at getting at all of the development in the state of Vermont. Um, I think, you know, we all know that water quality, you know, has been on the forefront in, in the last decade uh, in Vermont, and we all knew, that, we all know that we, what we've been doing is ratcheting up our water quality programs, our, our, our agricultural water quality programs, and our water quality programs uh, affecting other, other, other sectors of, of, uh, of Vermont's economy, and it just seemed like the wrong time to be going the other way. Uh, on wetland review and permitting when we know that really we need to have increased protection for water quality. And so that's, that's a big concern that, that uh, BNRC has as we look at this. Uh, with regard to the federal questions about the Army Corps system, I'm not going to repeat what was said. I, 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 I second what Phil said about the Army Corps has two staff people in the state. Their programs, and you should hear from them, but they're primarily based on general permit and nationwide permitting programs that permits uh, categories of activities, um, or if, if an activity is, is not very large in size, you could get covered by a general permit, um, and, you, and some of those general permits are non-reporting, so you don't even have to tell the Army Corps that you're complying, but you're just on notice, and theoretically there could be enforcement, but with two people in the entire state, and as Phil said, they're not just responsible um, for Vermont, it, enforcement from the Army Corps is not a, a very, it's not, they just don't have the resources to, to do vigorous enforcement. This is the exact wrong time to be relying on the federal level. I'll, I'll add to what's been said about the waters of the U.S. rule to say that what the Trump administration is about to propose is going to throw the whole system completely up in the air and go back to a time where there's been massive confusion about what is the water of the United States. Somebody accurately, I think, described the uh, Supreme Court decisions on waters with a significant nexus to navigable waters. But the Trump administration's proposal would go back towards navigable, in fact, waters. That's what they're prepared to propose right now. And based on what we've seen from the Trump administration, I believe that they could probably do it. And if they do it, there's going to be litigation, and there's going to be significant litigation for a long period of time. And I just don't see why we want to hitch our wagon to that uh, effort and that system. Uh, it's really, I think, I don't know what the Army Corps regions are going to do all over the country, because this is all going to get thrown into disarray uh, very soon. It could happen as soon as next week. The, the Obama rule was repealed. And we're waiting for Trump the administration to basically propose um, a new rule. So the last thing I want to address is the uh, H525 conference committee language that you spent some time talking about the last meeting. So the language in question was added to H525 in conference committee. And just to refresh everybody's memory, the language says the secretary of agriculture shall amend the required agricultural practices to include requirements for activities occurring in areas that are excluded from regulation by ANR under 10 VSA 902 because the area is used to grow fruit or crops in connection with farming activities. So basically it's saying, it's saying that the agency bag has to amend the RAP to cover uh, wetland regulation that's not being, that's not under ANR's purview. So I was in the conference committee when this change was suggested and, and made. I asked, I raised concern about the language. I asked what it meant, along with other people who were in the room. And I was, I was informed that the language did not change the current <coughs> regulatory structure, did not 
take jurisdiction away from a and and give it to ag. It basically saying that we want to make sure that for those areas that currently a and does not have regulatory authority over because there are farming exemptions in the wetland rules, as you well know, we wanted ag to cover those with an amendment to the RAPs. So I, would, I am concerned what I heard at the last meeting and in the letters that I've seen um, from Senator Starr and Representative Partridge that somehow this language may expand the farming exemption that exists in Vermont law. And so I just want to go on record and say that VNRC does not agree with that interpretation. And I'm happy to, to, to lay out my, our argument and our interpretation as to why we believe that the rules that were adopted by a &R <laughs> since 1990 and have not been challenged that define <laughs> farming activities and, and define um, farms that are that, that are exempt uh, are the, is the law, is the duly adopted law, and that the language that I just read, which doesn't reference changes to any of those things, doesn't, doesn't change the status quo. Um, but I just wanted to get that out there on the record because I don't know where that issue is. I don't know what this committee is going to do about it. I did do a record request. I submitted a record request to the Agency of Natural Resources and the Agency of Agriculture. And the records that I saw from the Agency of Natural Resources show that they were concerned about that language when it was proposed, that they thought it was confusing, that they believed, uh, even though it was confusing, that it didn't change the status of regulation uh, over wetlands and farming in the state of Vermont, that in response to the letter that I referenced, that they, they, they do not agree that the wetland uh, status for farms and exemptions has been changed. And I found uh, I don't, a draft letter from Secretary Tevitz to, to, to uh, Senator Starr and Representative Partridge that seems to say that he doesn't think that the regulatory status uh, of wetlands on farms has changed. But I don't know if it's a final letter. It wasn't signed. It was from July. But I have a request in for the agency of ag, so hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll see more about that. But I just want to, I just want to go on record saying we do not agree that that language has changed anything. Certainly this committee is, is been set up and you're looking at these issues and, and you, you, you're going to discuss that and maybe you'll propose some changes. But, um, but I just wanted to put that out there because I don't know what the status of that issue is. Yeah. Um, I guess I would start by saying <coughs> um, when that language was added, it was proposed by the House to the conference committee. You were sitting in the room, yep. and I don't recall one question from I, you. I spoke to Representative Partridge in the hall along with Senator Polina. Oh, after yep. the fact. Well, it happened very quickly, and everyone broke. And I said, What is this language? It wasn't too late to deal with it. We could have had to go to the floor and have to be voted on. Um, and I, I believe that the Legislative Council wasn't even in the room, so it had to go be drafted up. Um, so, it may have been after the conference committee broke, but it wasn't, it wasn't over. It wasn't a resolved issue. And the records that I found from the Agency of Natural Resources show that they were considering uh, raising concerns about it before the final vote if, in fact, the language would change the status of uh, farming um, under the wetland rules. And they obviously felt that it didn't, so they did not raise an objection. And to your I don't want to get into this with you because it's all your opinion. And, yep. you know, if, if, I don't want to be rude to you, but, you know, if, if you want to sit and help make the laws and, and write them and, que and then question them, maybe, uh, maybe you should run for a rep or a senate and go through that process and you know, it's fine to be a lobbyist, but to sit there and ridicule our work, I think it's a little I'm bit not ridiculing out of, your work. Well, I'm, raising, I'm going on record with a different up, opinion. You're I have a different opinion. Stuff. I'm not making up anything. I'm stating my opinion, and I, and I, I just, <laughs> it, since this was a matter of record at the last hearing, I think it's important to go on record that there are other opinions about this, and I don't know the status of this issue. So I didn't want to let it go by. I don't recall us doing a lot of that discussion. There was a whole presentation about it by, by Michael Grady um, and a 
discussion about what that language meant and your opinion about that. Yeah. So I want to address that and speak to that. I would be remiss if I did not do that. Well, as far as I'm concerned, I stand by the letter that we wrote the agency. We knew what we were doing. I knew what I was voting for uh, when I supported that. I believe it was a unanimous vote of the conference committee. Uh, I can't talk for the House, but it, I think you were sitting there, so you know it was a unanimous vote. Right, and I, I, I said I immediately popped up and I had a conversation about it. I'm happy to submit the records. I'll submit the records I have to the committee. You can see that the records will show that a &R was confused. a &R did not agree with the interpretation, and that's their opinion, you know? So, and I don't know what the agency agriculture's position is. I didn't get a letter from a &R, but... Well, I can show you the records that I have with the discussions that I've seen. And I just want to, I just don't want it to go unmentioned and, and be assumed that everybody's in agreement about what this language says and does. Well, it's fine that you disagree. Just say that you disagree. I disagree. And so be it. Okay. I would just like to clarify, John, that the language was actually drafted by legislative council. I know that it was after that. He was not there at the meeting. It still needed to be drafted. My recollection is after the it, meeting broke up. My point was that no, it, it wasn't drafted. That, you know, Every was drafter drafted. had a copy. That's what legislation council does. People yeah. ask them to draft stuff, and they draft it. Yeah. So. At our first meeting, it hadn't been drafted. At the second meeting, it was drafted. Okay. Yeah. My only point was that it was there was an opportunity to address confusion because the conference committee approving obviously needed to be voted on in the House and the Senate. <laughs> There's some disagreement. I think that the, I just want to go on record. I would not be doing my job if I did not come here after hearing the discussion last time to say nothing about this. Um, and um, I'll submit the records that I have so the committee can see what a &R is saying about that language and what they think. And like I said, I don't know the status of it. I don't know what's happening. I don't know if, if the agency of agriculture is going to propose a rule that will, that will support one interpretation or the other. I don't know. But I just want, I just, I'm, in full disclosure, I would be not doing anyone a favor by not addressing this issue, since it, it did get, I thought, a significant amount of airtime at the last meeting of this committee. Thank you. Uh, Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Yeah. Good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you uh, for the opportunity to testify today. My name is David Mears. I'm the executive director of Audubon Vermont, and I realize that I'm only staying between you and probably some food. Oh, no, so, uh, no, we're you're good to go. We got one more witness after you. Okay, well, I'll, I'll be quick, though. Um, I, in some ways, I may be just putting a blunter point on some of the comments that my colleague, Mr. Hoffman, and Mr. Rogan have made already. I'll just start by noting that the, the role that Audubon Vermont has uh, in the state of Vermont as part of the National Audubon Society is to protect birds in the places they need to thrive. And uh, it turns out that when you protect birds in the places they need to thrive, you end up protecting our communities and our people as well. And that's uh, part of the reason I took this position on and I'm excited to be in it is because of my sense that in Vermont those things are quite constant. That is protecting our landscape and our environment uh, is entirely connected to and synergistic with the needs to protect our communities. I go a little deeper and say, in particular, specific to the areas of farming and forestry, that uh, we really we need an active and healthy farm and forest economy in the state in order to have a healthy working landscapes. We need uh, our environment depends upon maintaining and protecting those economic sectors. And I've been part of a series of conversations over the last couple of years, um, which I, I believe most of you uh, know about, of coalitions of, of groups, uh, farmers, uh, researchers, environmental groups, scientists, who have been asking the question in particular about what can we do for our farm economy in the state? And I know it's work that the General Assembly is very committed to as well. We know that farming is in crisis in this state, um, largely because we have such a predominance of dairy farms, and milk prices remain low, uh, the global economy, the food prices generally 
are, uh, create such an incredible impediment and obstacle for our farmers to be successful. So I can completely appreciate the desire to find every way we can to help our farmers. I will say then, with regard to the question that's presented before this committee and that you're addressing, which is the degree to which there should be changes in the jurisdiction of the Agency of Natural Resources over wetlands with specific regard to forest and, and farm practices, that you should not. But that is not the way to address the issues that face our farm economy. And in many ways, you may not fully appreciate the secondary impacts. I'm sure you don't fully appreciate the secondary impacts, but there is a long history of argument, of vitriol, of extreme disagreement over the nature of wetlands protections and the relationship of farms to wetlands. We have made progress in recent years in building coalitions of farmers and environmental groups to work together to find common ways that recognize that we need farms for a healthy environment and we need a healthy environment for farms. And uh, I know it's not intentional, but the nature of this particular conversation is one that will cause us to have to go back to our corners and have a significant fight at a time where I don't think it's necessary. Um, the idea uh, that we might rely on federal protections for wetlands in this state is, is not a sensible idea. Um, given what's happened in the National Administration uh, with the rollback of the existing programs and regulations, even before the changes and rules that have been proposed under the current administration, there's been significant confusion, a disinvestment in the Army Corps of Engineers programs and the EPA programs. And even before this administration, there were significant gaps in the federal programs that the state protections uh, filled in. That isn't to say that the state program is perfect or that it couldn't be improved. As, as someone who used to administer the program in my, my former role at the Department of Environmental Conservation, I know that there's unfinished work that I did not get to and that needs, uh, needs focus. The agency needs additional resources, uh, uh, whether it's through fees or it's general revenue. There are insufficient number of wetlands biologists to do the nature of the work that they need to do in delineation and giving feedback and support and responses to developers or our farmers or foresters or anybody who comes into contact and interacts with that program. So resources are an important critical piece of that. There could be and should be more investment in mapping and delineation of wetlands and making that information more easily accessible and compiling all of the various information that's kept by our communities around the state, by researchers and other scientists and making that information available so that if you are proposing to build a project, you know where to avoid uh, building. There's lots of good reasons to avoid building on wetlands. Not just the, not just protecting wildlife. As it happens, though, uh, wetlands, the bogs, fens, marshes, uh, swamps, the forest, uh, forested floodplains, all of those wetlands are vital. They're such rich ecosystems. And the critters that, that they support and that depend on them then in turn support the broader ecological values of the state. Our birds depend upon having healthy wetlands. But put that to the side for a moment. We should also avoid building on the wetlands because they're so vital to our communities for flood resilience, for clean water, whether it's groundwater or it's surface water. It turns out there's emerging science showing how rich wetlands are in terms of storing carbon. And the, the opportunities to restore and grow and build on our clean water protections and our climate goals <coughs> depend upon wetlands. They turn out to be this vital, really critical um, uh, feature. It also becomes a subject of such vitriol because for most of us, we've grown up in an era where that's the swamp. We think of them as unimportant and secondary and an interference in our, our, our rights of private property development. And I fully appreciate that there's, there's a valuable and important balance to be struck as we develop these programs. But reducing the program, uh, the jurisdiction, changing and tinkering the jurisdiction of the NCU of Natural Resources doesn't help in finding that balance. I think I would certainly welcome this committee or the General Assembly um, playing an appropriate oversight role over the agencies and making sure that they improve and update the regulations. It's been a decade since the last round. We know new information. The agency could invest in doing updates to those regulations. Uh, they should they could bring in work groups and have you know recommendations that are developed with expertise of scientists and policymakers and economists and we can do a better job of including foresters and farmers in that process that would be an appropriate and and a necessary action to take 
Another thing that the legislature ought to consider are the ways in which you can use some and direct either existing public funds or think about considering expanding the, the public funding that go to restoration of wetlands. We're at a moment in time where no net loss is an insufficient policy. We already had such a major loss of wetlands. We have the opportunity in this state, we have a lot of open land. It may be marginal farmland, it may be uh, uh, land that's best kept in forest, but it's unprotected because it's privately owned. There's ways to invest in restoring those wetlands in ways that I think can enhance and help farmers by giving them payments for the value of land that could be providing these wetland services. Um, that can help forest landowners in terms of the resources available to them to restore and maintain their forests. Uh, there's, there's new clean water funding directed towards water quality that I think is appropriately directed to some of these projects. There's lots of ways in which this body can engage in oversight of the way those public funds are spent that I think would achieve both goals. That would help farmers, would help forested landowners, and would help the environment. So I'll, I'll leave it at that, and I'm happy to answer questions. I, I appreciate that this is, a, the, you know, the testy exchanges that uh, you, you've had the experience here, I, I think reflect, frankly, uh, it's just the tip of a pyramid of a much deeper and, and more angry conversation that is on its way to the extent that you dive into the place of statutory changes to reduce and uh, uh, meddle with the jurisdiction as it exists. Questions for David? Uh, <clears throat> one question. Well, I got quite a few. I'll do one. Um, uh, I asked the agency about, or brought up the issue of how about registering and licensing uh, these scientists and, and uh, the consultants that work in the wetlands field and work with people that, you know, the general public, <clears throat> um, so that it would, it would speed up the process. They're usually the ones that go and talk to people um, about their property and where to put a building or whatever. And uh, would, would something like that work from your experience uh, in DEC, like we, we do that with our septic systems, I think, now. Um, I, I think that's a really intriguing idea. There's, there's of course, risks and details to be managed around that, but the idea of having training programs and endorsements and so forth for the scientists uh, and the biologists that are involved in uh, delineating and identifying wetlands makes a lot of sense. And then figuring out how to right find the right balance so there's oversight, because there's an obvious, a natural tendency in those kinds of programs for the people who are paying the, the bills of the consultants uh, to uh, pick and choose those consultants that give them the answers they want to hear. So it does require a continued level of oversight and engagement of an agency in order to be effective. Um, but that might be a way of enhancing and growing the amount of resources uh, available to landowners, including farmers, uh, because we really do need more people out there with expertise about wetlands that are helping to educate the broader community about the value. And oftentimes the values may be unexpected. Uh, to a, a landowner may not fully appreciate that if they uh, build in or develop or drain a wetland, they may be losing important values. There may be risk to their own home or their own piece of property as a result of that. And oftentimes people don't fully appreciate that. They certainly don't appreciate the broader public values that we all benefit from. Yeah. Um, any, any questions for David? <coughs> well, uh, Carol? Um, I believe in, it was either S160 or H525. Um, there were pieces of each that made it into other, um, each other. Um, we did have an ecosystem services yeah. payment. I believe it got renamed yeah. to ecosystems management. That. But the goal was to <laughs> potentially come up with some uh, some funding, uh, and I'm not. I don't recall that we specified so that if if. If barns, for instance, were in the wrong place, uh, if farming was being done in places where um, it really wasn't uh, a good thing that we could somehow help the farmer uh, by 
reimbursing he or she to take it take it down a barn or or change their practices, maybe take livestock off a farm and, and help them to change to some other form of farming that would be less um, harmful to the waters of the state. So there, you know, we, I think we, there. We, did, we did include language about licensing uh, wetland scientists. So there were efforts to approach a, or um, address some of these situations. I think that's a really rich concept and, and we're taking a deeper dive into and, and more activity and action. Uh, I was part of a group called the Dairy and Water Collaborative, which I know um, has been right. presented to you. And one of our recommendations was to really take a dive into that. And I know the Gund Institute at the University of Vermont has been developing some information that I, I hope will be presented to you uh, in, the, in the coming session. Uh, that kind of provides some a pathway for how we might begin to pursue that. I think it's a really rich and, and uh, intriguing set of ideas. Yeah, yeah and they, <clears throat> they've either had their first meeting or are going to have a meeting right away in regards to that uh, part of the bill. Yeah, um, yeah I think it was called that. <clears throat> um, I have a question about the ecosystem services concept, which it has a lot of attractive aspects to it. Um, but to be frank, a concern I have is if someone has a business of any sort that's damaging the environment, do we typically pay them to stop damaging the environment? Adopt a practice that's less damaging? I'm, I'm trying to look broadly at how we regulate environmental damage, and I'm not sure how ecosystem services, and there's a very positive side to it. And there's another side that um, surprises because I just don't see it being applied broadly across um, commerce of all sorts. It's certainly true in, in the kind of the, the way that environmental regulations and regulatory programs have evolved. We have, we require people to meet basic minimum standards and haven't paid them uh, to, as an alternative to that. That, now, that isn't to say there haven't been many programs in which we provide funding to help people achieve their regulatory goals. Municipalities would be one of the most obvious examples. And, and that makes a, a lot of sense different than, say, a, you know, a, a DuPont or an industrial facility that, that makes a profit, but you know, helping public communities um, withstand the cost of regulatory changes makes, makes good sense and isn't something I would oppose. But having said that, there are certainly risks. The extent to which we get in as public entities uh, in, in <coughs> basically adopting a policy that we have to pay for people to protect the environment or to stop polluting, we have created a huge black hole of, uh, of a need for public funding. And, and it's in essence a sense of kind of environmental blackmail. Um, but I don't think that's what I have not understood the, the, uh, in the context of farming and the discussion of ecosystem services. Um, there's certainly a risk that we, we would just take funding, public funds, and give it to farms that are, are not farming in sustainable ways and are causing pollution. And, but I, that's not, not, the concept doesn't uh, predetermine that. That is, it's not uh, the logical outcome. A, a better outcome would be, as, as uh, Representative Partridge was suggesting, to the extent that the farmer is willing to make changes in the way that they farm to improve and be more sustainable, it may be a, a multiple payoff. We benefit as the public, and maybe we should um, help contribute to that. I suspect it will also benefit the farmers as well. There are many ways in which better practices help sustain soil, reduce erosion, <laughs> and that's the that's at least the, the hope of of these these conversations. Uh, but I think your your skepticism is is well heated. That we we need to be very cautious that we don't do it in a way that just, as so often happens with public funds, they, they often flow um, to activities that we didn't intend, unless we're really careful about setting up the program. Do you know of um, programs that are successfully paying for ecosystem services now, I mean, outside of Vermont, or maybe pilot programs within Vermont? I mean, it would seem like there would be some challenges around defining uh, the current status, defining the performance desire, defining that you achieve the performance, and that you're sustaining that performance as opposed to a payment that achieved a temporary gain that then you might lose in the next 
There are, there are other programs in, in, in other states that have been tried with mixed success, but I think we don't have to look very far. The, the natural, uh, NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, in effect, many of their conservation programs are payment for ecosystem services. And they have, uh, and there's also the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has a, a wetlands protection program that landowners can take advantage of that has the same effect. And they both work and they don't work. There are ways in which those programs have been used to kind of sustain existing farm practices and uh, kind of essentially subsidize um, bad practices. But there are also ways in which they've created long-term <laughs> change on the landscape. And you know, as you I'm sure often heard that you know the community of Middlebury benefited significantly from a lot of those NRCS funds that were used to protect and restore wetlands in Addison County in the Otter Creek watershed. So there are, are definitely examples of ways uh, that they can be applied, and we can look to those to, to as, as we think about a state program, to avoid some of the risks. Yeah, and Carolyn has a follow-up Kind question. of a follow-up to uh, what I was saying earlier. In the original drafts of those bills, uh, it was called the Ecosystem Services Payment, and we had talked about the fact that um, through the use of soil health principles and cover cropping, no-till, things like that, um, one can not only improve water quality but also sequester carbon. And so that was the original concept around the ecosystem services. Uh, what happened ultimately in the bill was it was changed to agricultural uh, environmental management um, program and that can pay for um, farm structure decommissioning. So. Um, it, it morphed a little bit, so it wasn't, Chris, it wasn't ultimately called ecosystem services payments, just so you know. Yep. Uh, no. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Kate. Thank you. <laughs> and we have, we have one member that's got to leave shortly, uh, but we have one more witness, Jeff Nelson. And Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to address the committee. Uh, my name is Jeff Nelson. I'm with VHB. VHB is the largest engineering firm in Vermont. I'm based in South Burlington, um, and I've overseen a staff of 30 environmental scientists, including wetland delineators and, and people that do permitting um, of wetland impacts and wetland restoration uh, every day of the week. So we're very familiar with kind of both how the federal rules work and how the state rules work and what the interaction is between them. Um, I've also personally participated in a number of stakeholder working group processes over the years here in Vermont, um, notably the process, the two-year process that led to the adoption of the 2010 revisions to the Vermont wetland rules, which were fairly significant at that time. And more recently, since November of 2016, ANR has convened a collaborative working group um, that met 10 times over two years to look at the current Vermont wetland regulatory framework and, and uh, look at how to improve um, consistency and clarity, but also maintain protection of wetlands. And um, that process, I think, um, was making very good progress uh, when we last met as of November of 2018. And one of the things I wanted to leave the committee with is that from our standpoint, um, it would be very worthwhile to continue those discussions. I think that within the context of a few more meetings later this year, um, that this group, I think, can achieve some consensus on some of the the outstanding issues. Um, and what I'd like to do briefly today is just highlight a few areas that, that we see some remaining areas that, um, that need to be worked on with that, with that group. And certainly, you know, that those meetings are open and to the extent there are folks that feel that they haven't been sufficiently included in the, the group, um, I'm sure that A&R, if they chose to, to continue the stakeholder process, <coughs> would welcome others to participate. Um, so first of all, aligning the definition of wetlands uh, between the state and the, and the, the feds um, we think is a good idea. Um, that's really, um, in my view, a technical and scientific um, 
uh, assessment of how you determine whether a wetland is there. So um, we think that the language in um, the alternative uh, wetlands um, draft that, uh, that you have makes sense. Um, and that, just to be clear, is not to say that the regulation of impacts to wetlands should be the same at the federal and state level. Um, I, I, you know, I have no idea what's going to happen at the federal level, and I think some of the prior uh, speakers have, have said similar things. Um, but when a wetland delineator goes out into the field and delineates a wetland, it should be the same. Uh, they use the same science to assess whether or not there's a wetland there on the landscape or not. And so we think that that um, makes a lot of sense. Um, secondly, um, the, the proposal that's been discussed with the stakeholder group um, is essentially to define class two wetlands in a different way than they are defined under the 2010 rules. And, the, the proposal is to essentially define wetlands based on characteristics. And um, we think that that makes a lot of sense if we can get the characteristics right. And um, what I mean by that is that um, you know, there are a series of characteristics that are listed in the draft language. Um, I think the working group had, had touched on some of those, not touched on others. We think there's a need to spend more time at the working group level to talk through that, with the idea being that um, there is not an effort here to reduce in any way the level of protection. In fact, um, what ANR has said through the working group process, and we agree with, is that um, the level of protection needs to be maintained um, the same, but there needs to be greater clarity and understanding on the part of landowners, on the part of um, public and private entities that have to comply with the rules to understand what a class two wetland is. And we think that it makes sense to define class two wetlands based on characteristics. So we think that that's a, um, that's a, a good way to go, um, but again, I believe there's more work to do with the working group. Um, then when we think about how um, things are regulated and what is regulated, in, in the draft bill um, and through that this came through the working group process, uh, really defining um, the types of activities that would um, require review and permitting by ANR. So dredging, um, draining, filling, um, or cutting vegetation. And again, I think um, these are um, I think these are useful ways to look at um, how wetlands should be protected, how impacts to wetlands should be regulated. And I think that um, this is a, 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 an approach again that I think could use a bit more refinement through the work of the group, but I think that it does make sense, again, not with the idea of reducing protections, but maintaining, or I would argue in some cases even increasing protection, because you're looking at the things that, that, that are proposed to be done that actually impact the functions and values that the wetlands are, are performing. And then, subsequently, the review standard um, is not based on eliminating the consideration of functions and values, it's actually based on assessing the impacts of a proposal that would be dredging, draining, filling, et cetera, on the functions and values. So um, to the extent someone was proposing to fill a wetland that was important for flood water protection, um, that would be something that would, that function is protected under this language, and that um, there would have to be a determination that that impact was not undue in order for someone to be able to, to undertake the activity. So we think that it gives the same level of protection that exists today um, with the added benefit that it provides clarity and better opportunity for compliance to make sure that people, people know what they need to do, what they're allowed to do, and what they, what they can't do. And then finally, regarding the topic of uh, certifications, uh, we agree that um, it makes sense to pursue this. Uh, as you may have heard previously, New Hampshire has a program that is very rigorous for the certification of wetland scientists. Um, and we have a, an office in New Hampshire that um, does a lot of this kind of work as well. And the program there is very well established. Everybody understands what the roles and responsibilities 
of a, a certified wetland delineator are, um, much as everybody understands the, what a septic designer or a professional engineer is allowed to do within the scope of their certification. So we think that um, the language as proposed uh, would set up a, a study of that, um, and we think that makes sense to get the ball rolling on that, because I think that could also facilitate protection as well as um, you know keeping uh, keeping things moving by not having to, to do do work twice. So that is what I wanted to cover, and I'm uh, happy to answer any, any questions we have. Yes. Question. Uh, so New Hampshire has a, a system like we chatted about. Correct. Yeah, New Hampshire certifies. Um, wetland delineators, and that's the requirement if you're going to apply for any kind of state permit. And do they have an overview uh, from the agency somehow so that even though they're out there certifying, is there a check on these folks? Is there a I state system? Yeah, I don't know exactly how that works in terms of um, you know what the oversight is for uh, the wetland delineators, but um, we could certainly, I, I'm sure that folks in our Bedford, New Hampshire office know that and we could follow up with the committee, but I, I, I'm not personally familiar with it. Well, we, we haven't talked to them. Yeah. Really, yeah. So, you know, if we get closer to something like that, we'll, we'll get hold of you. Yeah, certainly one of our certified wetland delineators from New Hampshire could come over and speak to how that works. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm wondering, I feel like I might have heard you say you both support the language submitted, um, or I didn't hear you say you oppose any of it, but that you also think that the stakeholder needs to do a little more work. So, so I actually sent to the committee assistant this morning a markup of this language. Okay. So we think that the framework is good, but we think that there are a lot of specifics that still need some, some tweaking. We suggested some edits uh, and some additional revisions. And, and I guess just to be clear, um, this is not just, just me or it's not just VHB. We've been working with a number of regulated entities, public and private. We had a, um, a sub-stakeholder group meeting yesterday with representatives from utilities, ski areas, municipalities, transportation, um, and other developers. And so, um, you know, this, our comments, I'm not officially presenting them on behalf of, of VTrans or anyone else, but they reflect input from, from all those folks. Um, and certainly, um, everyone in the room was in favor of continuing the, the stakeholder process, which I think will help you folks do your job. If you know, one of the things that I was very impressed with in 20 when we got to the 2010 changes to the wetland rules is that you know all of the people involved in that process were in agreement with that the changes made sense at that time, and I feel that they've served us well. But I think that we're at a point now where based on kind of the history that's accumulated, there's an opportunity to, to tweak this and go in a somewhat different direction and still achieve the protection that we all are looking to get. Thank you. Yeah. Any, anyone else, uh, Harvey? Yeah, are you talking about the stakeholders group that was working the last couple of years uh, and looking at the wetlands issue? Well, this is a group that was convened by a and and we had 10 meetings um, and it was pretty, Broad representation. I don't. I'm not sure um, who from AG if was involved or if they were specifically involved. But it was really looking broadly at wetland regulation um, and how to update the statute and the wetland rule. Um, but uh, there were probably 30 people or so that showed up at most meetings. Okay. Well, the reason I was asking because I wanted to know who was here from agriculture. <laughs> well, I mean, I'd have to look back. I, I mean, can provide a list of individuals. What's that? Who are I can provide a list of individuals who are invited to the yeah. And Lori, and are, are you, Lori, are you folks uh, planning on getting that group going again? Or? Yeah, we're in support of doing that, yes. I'm not certain when precisely. Um, and, um, I want Maybe to be, next year? I want to be respectful of this process that you're going through, but also, you know, hearing from the stakeholders yesterday that they want to be in the office of the you know, not opposed to continuing that conversation. 
and I guess our thinking on that is that as I read um, the 525 that you're obligated to produce something by January 15th. Well, um, yeah, if you folks could meet. Well, that's know, what I was. Anything you. Right. Yeah, I mean, we've got four, we have four more meetings. Sure. And yeah. they stretch into December, yeah. so um, well, if you folks could come up with yeah. suggestions, that would be yeah. great. Yeah, I would suggest that our that this stakeholder process could be going on concurrently. Um, you know, presuming that it's possible to, to schedule a few meetings with the group, but that that we could, I think, narrow a lot of um, the areas that are still in our need to work. So, and David, did you say you're part of that stakeholder? I'm one of the meetings. Pardon? John is, and and Bill Huffman and Jared. Yes, yeah, so the environment community not, not true, though. I, I have not had time. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Sure, thanks. Uh, that concludes our witness list. Um, we, uh, we need to take just a minute to chat uh, in regards to story next news, uh, which is supposedly going to be in the Bradford Fairly uh, corridor. That we've been trying to get a, um, yep. a place. Uh, we tried Lake Quarry, but they were booked. Yep. Um, so we would appreciate some suggestions. Uh, uh,